But have you wearing your shirt? <laughs> Someone's gonna notice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll, it'll just be so. <laughs> so a little baby yoga. You're just going to have to kind of like stretch. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. We have, we have a lot of stuff that we set in the middle, so we can talk about this. I'd like to call to order the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board here on the 4th of May at 5 o'clock. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Benny. Present. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Schaefer. Present. Commissioner Elper. Present. Commissioner Thompson. Present. Commissioner Mentz. Present. Commissioner Olson. Here. Vice President Smith. Here. President Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I would like to announce that I'm, I'm going to appoint myself as well as Commissioner uh, Mentz to the planning committee, planning committee meeting. Um, due to the fact that we're having a hearing um, about um, naming about Bridal Vale and we need to have all three um, at large commissioners plus also the district commissioner um, available for that hearing. So I just want you to know, so it's the commissioner of the impacted area. I'll take an approval of the agenda. Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Okay. All uh, right. Then the approval of the minutes of April 20th, 2022. So moved. So, second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. That motion carries also. All right. Um, oh, I should have announced. I apologize. Anyway, unfortunately, Superintendent Bangora is not able to be with us, and um, I hope that he's well. Um, and holding him in the light. And so we are going to be having our superintendent report from our deputy superintendent, Jeringle. Thank away. you, President Forney. So I'll start with citywide recreation highlights. 1,140 1, people attended egg hunts and buddy, bunny events and iftar um, throughout Easter and Ramadan weekends in our parks. Highlights of some of these events are, um, number one, McCray hosted an excellent dog adventure um, day at the park with 50 dogs registered and over 100 people in attendance with their furry friends. Number two, Nokomis neighbors joined at the community center for the annual Bunnies on Bikes spring event. Families enjoyed decorating their bikes, making crafts, entertainment by a unicyclist enjoying a bonfire and roasting marshmallows before hunting for treat bags hidden around the park. At Harrison Recreation Center, um, there was a spring egg hunt event for youth and families. There was a combined attendance of 165 youth and families participating in activities. At Luxton, um, celebrated the first ever iftar dinner. Over 60 people of different ages and backgrounds attended. At Farview, hosted an egg hunt with 100 people in attendance. Spring break fun for kids was held at Stewart Park um, wood, where they did wood fire um, burn designs. And then there was full service schools at Bethune held a, t a storytelling workshop done um, by Wilding for 15 students. Every kid got up to the mic on the last day for our six week session. The theme was the great outdoors, which was designed around Minneapolis parks. Proud to say we held a youth job fair. The NPRB hosted a job fair over the weekend, this past weekend that is, with 200 people in attendance, 27 employers, and over 130 youth. Sparked Studios, spring break programs. Free programs are offered at, are, were offered at Powderhorn, Harrison, Luxton, and Whittier Parks over spring break. More than 30 youth learned photography, editing, storytelling, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube sensations, youth beat make, 
makers and participated in esports video game tournaments. In athletics, the Minneapolis Umpire Association conducted numerous trainings for umpires in preparation for the start of the youth and adult softball and kickball leagues. Our adult softball and kickball leagues begin play this week, or begin to play the week of April 24th. Nearly 300 teams and 5,000 participants are registered in the leagues across the city, which will run from April to July. At golf, league registration is at 100% of 2021 numbers and season pass sales are already approaching our 2021 numbers. Meadowbrook Golf Course is near, nearing completion and MPRB is hoping to take control of the building in about two weeks. Columbia's back nine is scheduled to open May 6th after 18 months of construction to reduce flooding. <clears throat> For aquatics, uh, aquatics has hired about 60% of the lifeguards needed to guard all of the beaches and water parks for 2022. We are currently outreaching, um, attending and hosting job fairs and recruiting for additional staff. This is a nationwide trend as there is a 40 to 50% nationwide, nationwide lifeguard shortage. Ice arenas, staff are working on Fall 2022 and winter 2023 ice bookings. Northeast Ice Arena is hosting over 200 hours of indoor activity rentals this spring. And Parade Ice Garden is hosting the figure skating competition this week, May 6th to the 7th. Our archives area has seen a significant increase in research requests over the past few months and have resumed on-site research visits for the public at the headquarters building. Environmental conditions in the archive storage area have been brought up to date in the accordance with the archives emergency preparedness and recovery plan, which included the installation of fire extinguishers and monitoring of environmental conditions. Stories from the archives for the employee newsletter last quarter included the history of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park for Black History Month, the photographs of women and girls playing basketball in recognition of Women's History Month, and the NCAA Women's Final Four Tournament taking place in Minneapolis. Finally, McCray Park celebrates its 75th birthday this year, so the archives shared photos of its construction in the 1950s, an updated recreation center, and programming from the 1970s. Research into records retention best practices and the historic implementation of Elwell Law for report to the Racial Equity Action Plan continues as, pri as priorities in the coming months. Park Police, we received a very nice note from Mike Trulinger. Um, he is the Battalion Chief and Public Information Officer for Hennepin Emergency Medical Services, wanting to extend his gratitude for the officer in our 830 squad, which is Officer George, on April 29th <clears throat> for his assistance with an elderly disabled person with a powered wheelchair scooter whose battery had died. Despite several attempts to line up a ride and, and tow to help the person, ultimately it was decided to be more expedient to just push the patient on his scooter home a few blocks to his senior high rise where he could recharge the battery. This photo was taken um, of that incident and um, Mike says he's uh, this happened during an extremely busy time of the day when all other resources were stretched thin, and yet it was simply the right thing to do and appreciates our teamwork. Environmental stewardship. First up is in forestry. After just one month of planting trees, forestry crews have planted 6,500 new trees. This is more than half of the 9,200 trees that will be planted this year. One of the keys to increase productivity is an auger, um, is to auger holes rather than hand dig them. While using an auger is faster than hand digging, the most important benefit is reduction in injuries to our arborists. Boat launches, this is exciting. Um, so boat launch is open for this season with AIS inspectors. The public boat launches at Bede Makoska, Lake Harriet and Lake Nokomis open this open for the season at 8 a.m. on Sunday, May 1st. Woo-hoo. 
Um, trained MPRB environmental education staff will perform aquatic invasive species inspections on all watercraft and water related equipment that enters and exits the lakes through the boat launches from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days per week throughout the summer. Chains will be pulled across the boat ramps to prevent access at times when MPRB inspectors are not in sight. Staff perform more than 9,000 watercraft inspections in 2021 and expect the boat launches will be busy again this year. We had a fire at Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden. Um, this happened last Wednesday. More than one wildflower was started in Southworth Park, leading authorities to believe it was arson. The fire in the wildflower garden was in a hard to reach wooded location and in the vicinity of a population of endangered and protected dwarf trout, trout lilies. Staff did an incredible job managing the situation and ensuring the safety of visitors and the well being of the garden's historic plant collection. No structures were impacted by the fires. <clears throat> we owe a big thank you to Wildflower Garden staff Elise Jacobson, Maria Montero, Charlotte Cottery and Susan Wilkins. Officer Lynette Yonke, uh, crew leader Ar Ar uh, Armandando Santiago Toledo, plumbing foreman Joe Murdoch, and the fa fabulous Minneapolis police firefighters on site that day. This was a great example of cross collaboration, strong decision making, and fast action to protect parks. You will also see reference to this in the P's and C's. The 2021 Community Garden Racial Equity Evaluation is complete and is on the Community Garden webpage. Key takeaways from the 2021 evaluation were applicants and plot recipients were more diverse than in 2020 and more reflective of Minneapolis racial demographics. Goals included improving outreach strategies, mitigating barriers that prevent people from participating, and creating gathering spaces within community gardens. The full report is available on www.minneapolisparks.org slash community gardens. And asset management, <clears throat> maintenance and operations. April was a very busy time for operations staff. The beginning of spring marks the turning of the page as we close out our winter operations and transition from snow removal and ice rink maintenance to inspecting playground equipment, shelters, and preparing courts and fields for a busy summer ahead. In many areas, tennis practices have already begun. In the weeks to come, any remaining ice rink materials are being organized and removed from rink locations for summer storage and the initial stages of turf and park infrastructure is being assessed for winter damage. Park ops will be working closely with their crew leaders as well as the trades department to get repair projects scheduled and addressed. Additionally, many MPRB four-legged friends will be participating and will be appreciating a fresh coat of wood chips in their parks as well. Pictured um, in, uh, let's make sure it's that one. Yeah, pictured here. Um, is Lake of the Isles Dog Park receiving wood chips earlier this week. Uh, lastly, park maintenance staff are sweeping and cleaning up the residual salt and sand left behind from winter on our past trails and parking lots. Horticulture. The horticulture team wrapped up the dormant pruning season at the end of March. This past month, several large pruning projects happened around the city. One major project was rejuvenation pruning of several lilac stands along Minnehaha Parkway in South Minneapolis. While lilacs are usually pruned right after they finish blooming, when major health issues exist, a full rejuvenation pruning is best performed in the, win in the winter months while plants are dormant. Many of the established lilac stands throughout the city have not been regularly pruned and now, combined with widespread lilac blight, are no longer in good condition. Rejuvenation is the horticulturist team's best action to avoid permanently losing these shrubs. Some stands may be in poor enough health that they won't be able to rebound while others will come back strong. Those that rebound will be added to the pruning rotation to ensure proper structural pruning occurs in the next few years. Moving to planning, we have the Hennepin, or sorry, we have the 
Um, Kenilworth channel repair. This channel will remain open while the project is finished up and the bank stabilization, finished up with bank stabilization and spring planting a project that removed old wooden walls in the Kenilworth Channel and replaced them with naturalized shoreline is nearly complete. The bulk of the work was completed December last year. On April 25th, the project resumed with bank stabilization and planting vegetation. This phase is expected to take two, excuse me, four to six weeks. The channel remained open to paddlers, but please stay away from the areas where work is being performed. Please do not disturb the new plants. Oh, sorry, um, public meeting and on-site tour scheduled for the North um, Minneapolis Riverfront Trail Connection Project. The proposed 1,000-foot trail connection extends to trail pass, extends a trail past the terminus of West River Road and creates new riverside experiences in North Minneapolis. It will connect to the 26th Avenue North Overlook, which opens, which opened last May, to the downtown riverfront and the Grand Rounds. The MPRB is asking for community feedback to help develop a preferred concept. Input can be offered through any of the following means. A public meeting on May 9th from 6 until 7.30 p.m. This will be an online meeting with a presentation allowing enough time for questions and feedback. The presentation will be posted online after the meeting. A site tour on Saturday, May 14th from 3 until 4. Participants will meet at Ole Olson Park. 2325 West River Road and walk to the Mississippi River while design team members explain the concepts. An online public comment form is also available to collect general feedback on the project at www.surveymonkey.com backslash r backslash 26 dash Olson dash trail. Visit the Park Board project page to join the meetings. North Commons Park Phase 1 improvements, the, con the concept design and community engagement phases have begun for North Commons Park Improvements Project. Staff recently released the series of community engagement opportunities, including open houses, both virtual and in-person, staff consultant office hours, and uh, an RFP for paid community collaborators, and a week-long design scheduled for late June. The project will build a new community center, a new water park, a new playground, and a new parking lot along with other site improvements. The concept design phase is scheduled to be complete after 2022. For more information, visit our website. And last but certainly not least is the Carpentry Training Program Year 2. In concert with the Hennepin County's uh, productive day training program. The MPRB will build at, on last year's successful carpentry training pilot program. Paid trainees residing, paid tra trainees re resided the Art Godfrey House in Shute Square, learning the basics of the carpentry trade during the three month course. Trainees uh, spend four days each week in the field and one day each week gaining basic life skills are paid $15 per hour for their time and are provided with basic tools and personal protective equipment. Their work resulted in the rehabilitation of the structure which had been subjected to rotting siding and ornamental um, woodwork. All five trainees who completed the program are now employed with construction companies as union carpenters or laborers. In 2022, the training program will be extended to a six a full six month course focused on Longfellow House and the Stevens House, both of which suffer from the same issues as the Art Godfrey House. There we go. Wonderful, wow. Active in the parks. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions of uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringle? Any questions? No? Okay. All right. So uh, with that, then um, any reports that uh, commissioners have of their appointments to outside boards, commissions, or the committees? Yes, uh, Commissioner uh, Benny. Thank you, President Forney. Um, I attended a meeting of the City Audit Committee on April 25th, and I have a couple of highlights. 
Um, the first is the police, uh, Park Police body worn camera audit was completed. Uh, this is a biennial audit mandated by state law. Uh, the report states that the MPRB Police Department operates within compliance with state statute. Uh, the audit is complete and the report will be uh, filed with the state. Uh, the second, um, I think, um, interesting thing that we talked about um, was the um, internal audit director, Patrick, presented an opportunity with the new city government structure. So uh, the internal audit uh, department will remain independent, not reporting to the mayor or council, but continuing to report to the committee. And going forward, additional staffing is being recommended to add public safety auditors with subject matter expertise who can be dedicated to risk-based audit of public safety functions at the city. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Awesome. Many questions to uh, Commissioner Benny. Thank you for the report, uh, Commissioner Menz. Uh, yes, I attended the Board of Investment Taxation meeting last Wednesday uh, prior to and through our budget retreat. And we're currently working through not having a staff person at the BET, and it's been challenging um, to work without a staff person dedicated to the independent nature of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. So we're working through that. We're getting staff recommendations from HR um, at the city. Uh, one of the things that the the board did decide is to do an independent study of some interesting bonding measures to almost preview some bonding and save some money, save the taxpayers money by, by borrowing money before interest rates hike up. So it was kind of an interesting discussion because usually we would have the Board of Investment and Taxation staff person do that, but we had to sort of commission an independent uh, contractor through the city. So that's going forward. We'll have another meeting on May 11th, but that's sort of where we're at. Thank you. Any questions to Commissioner? Men's. Not seeing any. Okay, moving on. We're on to our consent agenda. Um, any people want to pull any for discussion? Uh, otherwise, it's resolution 2022-181 uh, through 2022-1. No, no, they're all independent. Anyway, 2022-185, 2022-184, 2022-187. I would love to have a motion on those. <laughs> I would move that slate. Okay. Seconded. Thank you. All those in favor of uh, moving those um, items, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that action also moves. All right, that carries. Thank you. Okay, on to standing uh, committees. We have the planning uh, committee. Planning committee? Who, who's, <laughs> who's up for that one? Me. Yes, good. For, uh, Commissioner Elper, go for it. Yes, I would like to move resolution 2022-178. It's a resolution approving the creation of a parkland development and easement agreement with Crow Companies for application of the private land maintained for public use parkland dedication option to a proposed development at 310 North 2nd Street in the North Loop of Minneapolis in order to provide a connection between public streets and the Cedar Lake Regional Trail. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that matter? I'm not seeing any lights. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries as well. Admin and finance, who's up this round? Yes, I would like to make a, make a motion to move resolution 2022-151. Resolution approving a subsequent cooperative agreement between the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission in the City of Minneapolis for the construction of the park elements and the city elements and the commission's reimbursement to the MPRB and the city for said construction of the Water Quality Improvements Project at Bryn Mawr Meadows Park. Anybody in a second, please? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the matter? I'm not seeing any lights. Oh, yes, one slide, please, um, Commissioner Benny. Uh, just a quick thing. I was in the packet. Um, I didn't see any graphics um, associated with this one. And I went back to the 23rd of March, too, and I didn't. Is there a way just to have that? I'm just curious to have it sent what the, you know, the concept plan that's been prepared so far. Would you like a little presentation on it? Do we have one, Tyler? Yes.
Would you like to just see the map, or you want to see have I mean, a better explanation? Are, uh, Commissioner Benny, are you looking for um, a, a, a graphic of the whole project, or just um, what's the, going on? The stormwater, the, the stormwater basins, basically, and how they're connecting into the city infrastructure. But and I, I couldn't find it online, so. Okay, so we um, we don't have um, you know technical drawings online, but we can. Uh, we can certainly make that available to you. Um, I can certainly forward that if you'd like. That would be perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. All right. Um, not seeing any other lights and everything. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. On to the next resolution, Commissioner Schaefer. Yes, I would like to move resolution 2022-173. This is a resolution to repeal resolution 2020-232, resolution directing the superintendent of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to make certain changes pertaining to policing within Minneapolis parkland, including ceasing the use of Minneapolis police to staff park sanctioned events and ceasing park police response to Minneapolis police department calls. A second I'm looking for? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that item? I'm seeing one light going on. Okay, Commissioner um, Elper. Thank you. Um, fellow commissioners, I am voting no tonight on this resolution, and I would like to explain my vote and urge uh, you also to vote no. First of all, as many of you have stated at our previous meeting, Park Police and MPD already work closely together by using the same dispatch systems and 911 technology. This never stopped, and the results of this resolution do not change that relationship. Second, this resolution is being brought to us on the premise that it will ensure safety at large park events, like the Twin Cities Marathon and Pride at Loring Park. The security threats at these large events are very real and terrifying. They include people driving large vehicles into crowds of event attendees and people with either legally or illegally acquired guns shooting into crowds. I remain skeptical about how more police will prevent these attacks. Third, whether or not this resolution passes, there's a high likelihood that there will not be the amount of security staff needed per policy in order to hold these events and that they instead would be canceled. We have already been turned down by multiple jurisdictions for event help. We have no guarantee that the Minneapolis Police Department, which is roughly 300 officers short, will be able to work park events nor may they want to at our permit holder price of $85 an hour when private institutions like Orchestra Hall and the Minnesota Twins are hiring off-duty Minneapolis police officers for between $120 to $150 per hour. Indeed, events in our sister city across the river are being canceled right and left to this, due to the skyrocketing costs for security and lack of staff. Fourth, Around our city, we have serious public safety issues which are not getting the attention they deserve and that taxpayers pay for by our existing Minneapolis Police Department. Um, just yesterday, I attended a public safety meeting at Little Earth where people talked about mothers and their children under virtual lockdown due to the daily threat of gun violence. Think about not being able to leave your home because of fear of dying. Fifth and most importantly, we have a city police department with proven records of racism and violations of human rights. Have you read the Minnesota Department of Human Rights report? It is scathing. Now is not the time to invite and reward Minneapolis police officers with the opportunity to work beyond their 40 hour per week job, especially when the department barely can do their core job. To vote yes on this resolution is to provide $190,000 of bonus pay to Minneapolis police, which they do not deserve. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Thompson, we're close to um, open time, but go for it. Um, I, I just, uh, just in response to Commissioner Elper, I respect your thoughts. Um, and what you have heard from people, um, <laughs> the, 
the gun violence thing, though, when you're living over north, it's, uh, I have people who text me every night about the gunfire that they hear, and these are my neighbors. Um, there's, there's a, there are a lot of issues, and I, I respect very much that this does not solve all of the problems that we have. Um, but I do believe healing community starts with working together, and I furthermore believe that if we want to change systems of public safety, um, and Commissioner Men said it really well in our last in our last meeting that we need a seat at the table, and I think that we and our and our staff and our body um, are more nimble to maybe engage in those kind of relationships. And all this repealing does, because it was all the initial thing did, was just give the chance. And you did say that St. Paul has had to cancel a lot of things. I read that same article and I was like, well, this is exactly why um, I'm understanding from our expert, which is Chief Ohado, why we need to help come together. So I, I respectfully disagree and I appreciate all you had to say. Not seeing any, oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, pause because it is 5.30 and we do have open time. So um, we will, what should we say, take this up after our open time and we, um, open time. Thanks to all of you who want to share your thoughts and ideas with us during open time. Before we start, I want to provide an abbreviated version of the open time board rules. All individuals wishing to speak may call in before noon the day of the meeting to be placed on the agenda or can sign up at the board meeting prior to <clears throat> the start of open time. Um, I will be calling on people um, on the sign up list only. Open time for public input shall not exceed a total of 15 minutes with the time limit to be allocated by me, the president. Please watch the timer to be considerate of others here to uh, speak in the timer is right up here, okay? Uh, to speak and stay within your allotted time. During open time, public testimony will be given without debate and only clarifying questions from the board will be allowed. Two types of items that are not appropriate for open time in order to protect the privacy of all individuals. Um, those are pending in, uh, litigation and personnel issues. Please refrain from connecting, commenting, excuse me, on specific personnel issues. We will not tolerate discriminatory and or harassing words directed at anyone. Please um, ensure that all comments you make tonight comply with that policy. And we do have six uh, people who would like to speak tonight, so I'm gonna allow um, six minutes for each one of them. And the first person is Rachel Sarto, and after that is going to be Joe Mitchell. Rachel, are you in? I meant three, if I said, I apologize. <laughs> six people, three minutes each. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Give me a long night, gang. Okay, anyway. So is Rachel in? Rachel Sarto, is Joe Mitchell here? Okay, well, okay, we got Kat, um, you short call, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but uh, please come forward, and then after that is gonna be uh, Brian, uh, Bryn um, Casper, I believe. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> I, I wrote down what I wanted to say, but it was for a full 15 minutes, so I'm going to abbreviate. Um, <laughs> I'm here to talk about trees. Um, I spoke with a few of you guys about trees at the last meeting, um, and I have some more to share on this topic. So um, I want to bring your attention today to the current policies around tree conservation and how they're impacting our community negatively and not going nearly far enough to preserve and protect our environment. Um, I have a proposal for how we can improve this, and I hope that you will take that proposal under consideration both in the short term and the long term. Um, I became especially passionate about this issue after witnessing dozens of trees come down in my community in the past month. I live right next to the Stone Arch Bridge and the recent projects in Father Hennepin Bluff Park as well as MnDOT's restoration of the Stone Arch Bridge have together caused over 20 trees to be cut. These have included trees along the sensitive bluff area, old trees, and young trees that were recently just planted. Um, I encourage you to come to the area yourself and uh, take a look at um, what has been going on there, especially along the bluff uh, right next to the Stone Arch Bridge. 
Um, this is especially stark as it's being done in an area that is already sparse in tree life. And uh, some of the trees are being cut to make room for new park structures, all while an empty paved parking lot sits across the street. Um, and this board maintains a 200K plus surplus in funding to purchase property. So in attending the board meeting last week and reaching out to members of this board, we were able to reduce the number of total trees being cut in the Father Hennepin project. I want to thank Council Member Menz for his attention um, and action on this issue. However, I am asking for more to be done to protect our parks and tree canopy in both the short and the long terms. In the short term, uh, the MnDOT Stone Arch Bridge restoration project has taken to cutting down multiple trees along the bluff in order to improve visibility and uh, reduce graffiti. Um, at least eight trees have already been cut near my home and there is risk of many more going down on both sides of the river. I'm here to let you know that the community cares about these trees. We do not want them gone. In speaking with neighbors and even with the tree removal crew themselves, folks are very unhappy about uh, this seemingly needless destruction. I request the board to work with MnDOT to provide a report to the community on how many trees are set to be cut as part of this project, why, and allow for community members to have input into this decision, and then immediately reevaluate the destruction of any further trees and and commit to reducing this as a part of this specific project. Unfortunately, even if we make improvements for this specific project, there is a larger picture issue in our city that is causing the tree canopy to be reduced and putting our goals of increasing our climate resiliency at risk. This inefficiency ties directly to how the commission and city are structuring their goals and subsequently policies on tree canopy. You can take action in this session to prevent this from happening in the future. Last week, you saw the revised draft of the 2023 through 2026 strategic directions and performance goals. In attending this meeting, I heard a significant amount of thoughtful discussion around many of the important and beneficial areas of this proposal. I want to thank, is that it? Okay, very, can I just add one last thing, which is the, the proposal itself? I propose that you adjust the tree canopy section of this report to have the goal of, by 2026, implement a sustainable, quantifiable tree canopy increase plan that strengthens the resiliency of parks and riverfront territory and grows the overall canopy by 25%. This would be instead of uh, just replanting trees. Replanting trees yeah. would be a subpart of this goal, but really focusing on increasing canopy, as well as tracking and reporting how many trees are being uh, cut in any given project to allow both the board and the public a chance to understand what to tree on. reduction is happening. If you want to, or why don't you email that to us? Yes, so I definitely can, will. All right, that would be appreciated. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Grim uh, Bryn uh, Hasper, and then after that is Nicole uh, Cavender. Hello again, commissioners. Thank you for your time. Um, so when when the Hiawatha Master Plan passes, our support does not end. Our advocacy for the land, the lake, and the history of golf on this land does not end. We are energizing a community that cares about Lake Hiawatha and Hiawatha Golf Course um, to make this space the most inclusive, equitable, and ecologically logical championship nine-hole golf course surrounded by a beautifully restored ecosystem. Golf supported by nature. We are not losing golf or erasing golf or the history of golf at Hiawatha. We honor it while making sure the golf course and parkland are around for generations to come. I beg you to please do your research, read the master plan, read about and maybe even reach out to local BIPOC environmental justice advocates to get their take on this issue. We are just two years away from the 10 year anniversary of the last 10 year flood at Hiawatha. We have two years, give or take, before Mother Nature may make a decision for us. When the Lehman 18-hole concept fails to withstand engineering rigor, environmental rigor, and community rigor, you must not delay action any longer. Please support and pass the master plan. Thank you. And I hope you get to enjoy the beautiful weather today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, friend. Um, Nicole and then uh, Michael Gru. Hello, President Forney and all of the commissioners. It's really good to see you all again. I've spoken with many of you. Um, I'm Nicole Cavender, as you know, and I live in South Minneapolis. I'm speaking today about a different topic, the Native Land Acknowledgement. I am really hopeful, knowing that the MPRB is 
discussing the adoption of a native land acknowledgement. And when I spoke to family members to talk about it, um, they had not heard. And so then I talked with the tribal council members where my mother grew up and they had not heard either. Um, so I reached out to a few other tribal councils and found more confusion. So I request two things after talking with the elders from different tribal councils. I hope that the preferred form of contact via each sovereign tribal council happen directly with a tribal council member at at least the four most local tribal, Dakota tribal councils in no particular order, the Midwankatan tribal council, the Upper Sioux tribal council, Lower Sioux tribal council, and Prairie Island tribal council, specifically just because you know, the, the land that we are on more specifically affects these four, but contacting all four sovereign tribal councils, I don't mean to dismiss anybody who is Dakota um, because this is their homeland. That would be preferred for all 11 to be contacted uh, through a conversation in person, uh, preferably, but at least uh, a voice to voice. Um, please take and weigh in their advice most heavily while deciding the best consultant to provide education and guidance in the process all of you commissioners will be making should this move forward. Um, please have the person appropriate from the NPRB to reach out to schedule meetings, preferably as I said in person for a conversation with the tribal councils. And two, the second request, I know that was long. Um, while considering the wording of your native land acknowledgement, please, please consider the purpose of a native land acknowledgement, why they exist is specific. There was a brief mention of broadening the native land acknowledgement. There, there are, I agree, and many will, that there are many wrongs that have been done on these lands since it was stolen from the Dakota people. Those wrongs are extremely valid and deserve their own acknowledgement. To broaden a native land acknowledgement to include more wrongs to more communities feels insensitive to all the communities that would be in that acknowledgement. And I am concerned about the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board starting out this way. Thank you for your consideration. Perfect timing, very good. Okay, so next is Michael Grew, and my understanding is that Rachel Sarto is here. But Michael, next. Good evening, board members, community members peers from staff. It's nice to be here. It's nice to be able to see you all. And, and I want to come with, uh, I want to come with praise and thanksgiving, perhaps precautions, but a real um, recognition and acknowledgement of the efforts that are put forth here at the board. And, you know, it's, I don't, I don't like to coin the word hierarchy, but clearly there's protocol that's to be followed in that. And, and I believe the park board is making really great efforts to, to address that. Speak into the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Thank I'm you. glad you guys can hear me, but now everyone can hear me better. Yes. So with praise and thanksgiving and real appreciation and wanting to come and just recognize that as a longtime community member, raising my daughter in this area before moving out to other suburban areas and being around beautiful parks. It just doesn't rival. <laughs> Coming up in St. Paul, my hometown, crossing the river, it just doesn't rival. Driving here today, coming down miles and miles of river road from my home. That's my route that I've taken. It's where I used to drive before everyone drives it. And seeing so many different stories, so many different families, so many different people enjoying and appreciating what's being done here. And I agree with the three previous speakers wholeheartedly. And then I also recognize that there is a balance. There's, a, there's, a, there's an invitation and a challenge for that balance. So moving back in and having a uh, bird's eye view, if you will, of the park system, 
it's been beautiful to see that transform as, as we all transform, to see that grow and, and to be nurtured as we hopefully grow and are nurtured as well. Being an employee with Minneapolis Park and Rec Board has been amazing. It's been amazing. And it's been challenging. And I'm, I'm all the more blessed for it. And though seasons change, like our lives are faced with difficulties, we recognize and we appreciate creation, but I stand before you and I recognize and I appreciate the creator. And I appreciate what you do here. And I appreciate being able to say confidently and comfortably that any prior issues have been resolved. Thank you, board members, for your consideration. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Rachel, if you are here, we'd love to hear from you. Rachel Soto. One last thing. I am going to go out and paddle board right now. Oh. <laughs> I'd love to stay and enjoy the rest of it, <laughs> but I'd, I'd rather go out and enjoy the park and rec system that's around here. Uh. I don't know by any coincidence that 2019 didn't get the park and rec award. I'm just saying, if we were to look back upon past emails and whatnot, we might better understand that. But that being said, we're going for that title again. <laughs> Parks yeah. for all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Rachel. And then if Joe Mitchell, if he's arrived. Thank you. I'm sorry that I was late. Uh, so my name is Rachel Sarto, and I'm a mom and social worker living in the Standish neighborhood. Um, I wanted to talk with you about Lake Hiawatha. Um, I live about six blocks from Lake Hiawatha and from the Hiawatha Golf Course. Um, and I'm, I'm probably the, not one of the best informed people in this room or you know, someone that's, that's given a lot of time to this, and yet I just wanted to come and bring my voice because Lake Hiawatha has meant so much to us in terms of what it's like to live in the Standish neighborhood. Um, also, the golf course has meant a lot to us. We're out there skiing all winter. Um, so it's, for us, one of the things that we love the most about living, um, living in Minneapolis is the fact that there is so much nature. Um, however, I think about like the times where my, my son has been able to play at Wood Lake or places like that in other communities nearby. And something like that, that's so natural, um, seems like an opportunity of Lake Hiawatha, but something that hasn't been fully realized. Um, I am understanding that there's the comprehensive master plan that's been, been put forward and that you guys are considering to vote on, um, but that there is another proposal that would uh, make, the, make the lake more into kind of a holding pool and focus more on making more space for the golf course. Um, and I, I do understand that there's a, there's a deep history um, of African Americans having access to golf through that golf course, so I'm, I'm appreciative of that. And when I review the master plan, I see a compromise, and I see, I see education, and I see opportunities, and I see with the with the re retention of the nine nine hole golf course, an opportunity to express appreciation for that history while also expressing, uh, through the the master plan as I read it, and uh, the value of that of that natural space for wildlife, for human beings, um, and also um, connecting with the history of the Dakota in that area. So I'm thinking about the master plan as a, as a really respectful, caring, and meaningful uh, piece of work that was put forward and that, and that I support. And I just want to say that, that when I, when I read it, I feel excited. And I feel excited on a lot of different levels, including the way that it might be able to bring attention to the, the history of African and American experience in our neighborhood, as well as these other elements. So I'm seeing it as something that holds both of those things, and I look forward as a neighbor to embracing all of those things uh, if the master plan were to be voted on. So just wanted to offer my support for that plan and appreciate you all for your work. Um, as the previous speaker said, we have an am amazing system, and I'm so grateful to be in this, in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Joel Mitchell, are you there? Oh, he's not coming. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, the clarification. I will close the open time and move back to our discussion. And I believe that Commissioner Menz, you are wishing to speak. Uh, yes. So I've done a lot of reflection 
on this issue over the past couple of weeks and done a lot of uh, independent investigation uh, by talking with folks and feeling like how I can rectify this in my own brain because I change is necessary at the Minneapolis Police Department. It is obvious. It's been obvious for a while. And at last week's meeting during committee, or two weeks ago, it seemed to me that the best course of action was to have a seat at that table. But in going through the last two weeks and talking to many people, including young people who frequent the parks, and including people of color who frequent the parks, and wondering and asking the question just to them, and hearing that do more police at our events make them safer? And are we willing at this point as this board to reinstate our relationship with the Minneapolis Police Department? Is that, is that where we have our leverage? Two weeks ago, I thought maybe that was. And I think that it needed to go to this full board. And I was supportive of that. But I am voting no to that reinstatement because I think that it, right now, in, in light of the report that we knew was going to come out and we knew was going to say some difficult um, realities, it is scathing and it is scary. And it is scary that that culture has existed for so long. And I personally think that our change, the way that we impact this community in policing, is by forcing our staff to, to figure out a different way. And if we have to cancel events, there might be some events canceled, canceled temporarily. But I believe in our staff and our police department and us as a board that we can figure out different ways to police or keep safe people at our events. And I think that the way to do that is to to have some consequences, which might be that we have to cancel some events in, in an effort to figure this out in a different way to police. But during the campaign, in my own personal life, I value and support police officers and public safety. But I don't think that the current state of how we police in this city is working. And I cannot in good conscience, reinstate that relationship, at least with my vote. Thanks. Well, uh, yes. Wait a second. Point of information. OK, somehow that? I was thinking that was <laughs> Commissioner Schaefer's right. light. It's your right. Excuse me. I just wanted to, uh, Commissioner Men said uh, more police in parks. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that's an accurate phrase of what would happen if if we reinstated this. Can I ask Chief Ojado that? Certainly. I, I, oh, yep. <laughs> Chief Ojado, would you like to speak to that? Can I, can I clarify? Yeah. More police at park events. Uh, yes, I would like to have Chief Ojado speak to that. President Forney, Commissioner Thompson, I had a hard time hearing your question. Could you repeat it, please? I, I believe Commissioner Men said that that this, or implied that this uh, reinstatement would mean more police at park, or in park events. Is that an accurate statement given what this repeal would do? Um, President Forney and Commissioner Thompson, I, I don't think characterizing it as more is accurate. I think that we have um, baseline protocols in place around the number of officers that are required for certain activities and events, and we're trying to meet those baselines. And we have a scarcity of resources internally. So in order to hit those baselines, we need supplemental help. It's not about putting more officers at events. It's about hitting those thresholds. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, so, you know, I spoke at length at this, uh, in the admin and finance committee, so I don't need to go over everything. I think people know where I stand. Um, I'll be voting no, and just wanted to, um, you know, emphasize. And there's some other 
points that you know I definitely th I think everyone sitting up here should absolutely read uh, the report. Everyone listening should read the uh, human rights report um, or find a good summary. The Minnesota Refor Reformer had a good summary of some of the most egregious um, issues on there. Um, I think it's really important that we kind of all have a base level of understanding of what we're working with going forward. Um, and yeah, so you know, if this does pass, um, I, I actually had some questions for you, uh, Chief Ahado. Do you think you could, it, 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 if it wouldn't be too much trouble to perhaps a year from now or a couple years from now have perhaps a report on the effectiveness of restoring um, the park event relationship with police and you know, if we you know had this many officers come, which enabled us to have this more events, um, and you know, or it, because there is concern that it may not result in that, um, and I think it's important that we know that so that we can find other solutions if we still need to find other solutions. So, is that something that could be possible, President Forney, Commissioner Olson? I'm happy to provide that that report to the board. I know that President Forney um, has been meeting with Superintendent Bangora asking for more regular reports around the Park Police Department, and that certainly could be a topic for future reports. Great, yeah, I would appreciate that. Um, and yeah, and, and this is you know not related to this direct resolution, but you know people are bringing up gun violence a, across the city, and I mean it's just everywhere. Um, our, our city, our, our state, our, our nation are plagued by guns, and I know we don't have a ton of control over that, but I hope in our individual lives and, and other capacities we can work towards um, you know, reducing the amount of firearms in our communities. I mean, just the other day I was going to bed and heard a couple dozen semi-automatic gunshots, and when pulled next day, someone was killed a couple blocks away from my house, and someone was found bleeding out outside of a retirement home. And it's, um, I mean, there's just too many weapons in our communities and it's really frustrating. So um, I'll be voting no. I, I can't endorse working with this uh, racist uh, police department. Um, but I, going forward, I hope we, we can pursue this effectively, and, and I do trust that you'll be able to do that. So thank you. Commissioner Benny. I put my light on before um, you finished your comments, uh, Commissioner Olson, but I actually really appreciate what you just asked the, the, the chief, which is what I would ask as well, that um, you know, no disrespect intended to the members of this board that sat on the last board, but the last board didn't, they, they sanctioned the MPD, but they didn't do anything. And because of the um, pandemic, and events weren't, weren't happening. And so I think, as Commissioner Thompson said, you know, this is about community, and this is really only, I think, for the largest of the events, and bringing them back, I think, would be just so important for the community. And I also trust the chief, you know, the last me meeting when we talked about this, he talked about the ways in which he vets and um, assigns work and the police officers that he knows personally that I'll reach out to. And I, I, mean, I know this isn't popular and the report was horrible. And I'm so glad so many of us have read it and the, every bit of it. Oh. Um, but I, I know this isn't a popular statement, but they're, they're, oh, no, it's not all the police, it's not the whole police, it's not all of the individual members of the police force that have those behaviors, but it is, it is some, and they're, they're terrible, and they need to be rooted out. So anyway, I think that having these events back is, is to me, the weighing factor, and that we should be giving resources to the chief so that we can you know, expand some of our alternative um, methods that we are already deploying with our police force. Um, so I'll be voting yes. Thank you. Commissioner Schaefer. Uh, yes, I just want to um, concur with Commissioner Abene that I do support uh, the chief's direction in this and Superintendent Bangora's feedback around this issue and this idea of us coming back together and providing access to our parks that has been denied through COVID, through some of these events having to be shut down, I think is really important for us to celebrate and to get back to the posture of Michael and his enthusiasm around our parks and to be able to come together and say, you know what, we're, we're gonna face this together. Um, it was, um, that report made me cry um, reading that. Um, 
and we've got to do better. But this, this amendment doesn't do anything about fixing reform for MPD, punishing reform for MPD. It's denying greater safety for the general community at our, our events and for nonviolent situations and calls that may come up. So I will be supporting this. And, and the comments around gun violence, I absolutely agree, uh, Commissioner Olson. And it, it triggered for me, I'm just gonna read this briefly. This was an editorial, you can look it up by DJ Tice um, called A Crossfire of Hard Tooth on Crime and Policing. And he quotes a couple economists with a title, uh, a, a white paper entitled, The Demand for Protection and the Persistently High Rates of Gun Violence Among Young Black Males. And one quote in there is um, what really gets at my heart because he says, young black male homicide victims are 77 times more likely to have been killed by a civilian than by a cop. And this is where we have power as a board, right? What are we doing for our youth and our communities that are plagued for gun violence? Where are we stepping up? Where are we really having a plan to deal with how we're gonna handle that when that comes up in our parks? And it has. So that's my challenge to us. We all care about it. But I, from my perspective, this is a little different angle and this is more about the general safety of the community and not a statement against really trying to punish MPD in any way. Thank you. Commissioner Musage. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful to my colleagues for clearly having put a lot of thought into the decision that we're making tonight. Um, I also very much appreciate the work that Chief Ohado has done and Superintendent Bengora has done to educate the board about the actual impacts of the action taken by the board previously. Uh, I, when, we, when we made that resolution, um, we did it very rapidly and we did it thinking it would have a far greater impact than it did on the behavior of the MPD in our city. Uh, it also did not remove the MPD from the parks. Uh, they're still providing services to people that are in the park system when our staff is off duty. And, and I believe that we created a, a false belief in the public's eye that the MPD never would be on park property again after we passed that resolution, and it's just not true. Um, so this evening, I will be supporting the repeal of that resolution uh, and hoping that it brings us to a place where the public understands that we live in a very closely integrated city of public service in which people that are available to respond uh, may be coming from an agency other than the MPD to help them. Um, and if they're in a park, it may not be a park police officer that is going to be able to respond to them because they're not closest. So. Uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that, that this will get us to a place where people are, are more understanding of, of how closely everyone is working together to try to keep people safe and respond when they're in need. And that we are able to bring back events that bring people together. Because it, it, is, it is very important to people that they have those ability, that ability to connect with each other around things that bring them joy. So um, thank you for your time this evening. Oh. Commissioner Olson. All right, just two quick things. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we never ceased the relationship, but we did cease uh, Park Police response to Minneapolis Police Department calls. So is that true that we didn't, we haven't, since this resolution passed, we haven't gone to any calls outside of the parks that were stemming from? I'm assuming like you're referring Chief to Ohado. Yeah, Chief sorry. <laughs> Is that the President Forney and Commissioner Olson? If I recall the language correctly, it prohibited park officers from responding to nonviolent calls outside of the parks. Okay. So we have responded to many incidents of violence okay. um, in which officers, park officers, are in a position to assist. Um, my my primary concern is around emergencies that are not the result of violence. Mm -hmm. So there are medical emergencies, overdoses, car crashes, which this resolution technically prohibits a response to. And I think our officers have an ethical and a professional obligation to intervene when they can help. 
So it was the call, uh, calling officers um, to George Floyd, would that have been considered a violent or a nonviolent call at the time? President Forney, Commissioner Olson, that's an interesting question. The, the park officer that responded to that was, was responding to a request for backup. Mm -hmm. They weren't the initial responder to the forgery in progress at Cup Foods. They were responding to a, a plea for assistance from other officers. So is that, is that nonviolent? Is that violent? I'm not sure how I would characterize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's such a tough situation. And um, sorry, I don't have any more questions for you. Um, and because you do mention all the important situations where, where you know, we, we do, we are in a community and it is important that we um, support outside. But, you know, at the same time by, you know, responding to more calls, you know, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, if there's gonna be another tragic death caused by the Minneapolis Police Department, it's pretty much when. Um, and I just, I, it's just really, I know it's really tough. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have a park police officer at, um, you know, present at, at the murder of, of a civilian. So, but I, yeah, I don't, that's hyperbolic. I'm sorry, but it's, it, it did happen, I guess. Um, anyway, so I just had that question. Then I also wanted to request a roll call vote. Thank you. Request a what? A roll call vote. Oh, roll call. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing any other light. So, and, and <laughs> Deputy Su did you have a, I saw your light for a second. Secretary uh, President Randall. Forney, thank you. I was just gonna assist with the uh, resolution in terms of what the specificity was in terms of type of call. I believe what happened is during the discussion, there was an amendment at the board level. So that's why the actual resolved clause mm -hmm. is different than what the actual outcome was. So just a clarifier there. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So on that request and everything, uh, will the secretary please uh, take the roll call? Commissioner Abeni. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Elper. No. Commissioner Thompson. Aye. Commissioner Mentz. Nay. Commissioner Olson. No. Vice President Smith. Abstain. President Forney. Aye. You have five ayes, three nays, one abstain. That motion carries. Moving on to uh, resolution 2022-179. Yes, I would like to bring forward a motion to for resolution 2022-179. Resolution approving the temporary use of the bell of the USS Minneapolis being property of the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board by the Minnesota Navy League Council for the commissioning of the USS Minneapolis St. Paul LCS 21 at the Port of Duluth in May 2022. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Any need for on that item? No? Okay. Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Okay, on to the next resolution. I would like to move uh, resolution 2022-180, resolution amending the 2022 <laughs> Enterprise Capital Improvement Program to direct an additional $1 million to the Bidet Makaska refectory within the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park. Second. Okay, got a second. Any discussion on the item? Any discussion? I'm not seeing any lights, okay. All those in favor, and as, oh, this isn't land. Okay, so um, all those in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Okay, on to the next item. I would like to move uh, resolution 30 slash 2022. Resolution awarding a construction contract to Morcon Construction in the amount of $6,225,700 for the debate, Bidet Makaska Refectory within the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park per bid event number MPLN 1918. Pending approval by City of Minneapolis Procurement Division and Civil Rights Department, authorizing administrative use of 10% construction contingency up to $622,570 for necessary construction change orders that may arise within the contract and further authorizing the transfer of $750,000 from the Regional Park Operations Maintenance Grant Match Fund. Wonderful. Second. Second. Great. Um, any, oh, uh, Commissioner 
Schaefer. Yes, I would. Uh, I talked to Daniel earlier today, and um, thank you for just giving us an update um, and more detail around the boat launch that we heard from Depu Deputy Superintendent tonight. Thank you, President Forney, uh, Commissioner Schaefer, Commissioners. So a, a real high level update on the impacts of this project to the Bede Makaska boat launch. Uh, through the construction contract, we will be closing the boat launch this year uh, on May 30th through September 16th. Um, so allowing buoy holders, <coughs> excuse me, to get their boats uh, to their buoys and then closing that boat launch um, and then reopening it in the fall for removal. We do plan to um, engage the contractor around a potential delay to that closure to allow for an additional week to get boats on the water and then um, engage them as well around the possibility of a weekend or two that could be open during construction um, for anglers and for those who have their boats on the water. The rationale for the boat launch closure is really around the construction project itself. Um, it'll be used for construction material storage, both in going and outgoing, um, for a potential construction trailer, contractor parking. Uh, we do plan to slightly realign the north curb of the boat launch as well as part of the construction. We'll be installing erosion control both in the water and on land in that area as well, so maintaining that throughout the construction. Um, and then the intent is really, because it's such a tight site, to provide the contractor with enough space to uh, facilitate this the construction project um, within the timeline we've identified and while reducing costs as much as possible. We have been coordinating um, with all of the, um, both tenants that work around this area as well as um, other agencies already in advance of this contract award. The Minneapolis Sailing Center has done drop off and pick up operation um, when this boat launch has been impacted by a 2017 trail project. So they'll be reinstituting that drop off scenario while, while this area is impacted. The wheel fund rentals will remain open this summer for park users. We've been working with park board maintenance on all the things that they have to do both on and off the water. We do have uh, an emergency launch just to the north of our project site for the Hennepin County Sheriff. If there are water emergencies. The weed harvester will also use that area just to the north of the construction project. And then we will be working with the contractor to identify some parking areas to try to keep them out of the neighborhood as best as we can. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions uh, on that presentation, plus also the motion? Nuts. Oh, uh, yes, Commissioner Olson. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, we probably don't quite have this information yet, but at some point will we have estimates of, you know, annual revenue, profit generated from this facility, and if it will be able to kind of pay for its future maintenance costs and things of that nature? <laughs> Sorry, that's a big question. Thank you, President Forney. Commissioner Olson, I'll ask Shane Stenzel to come and help. Welcome, Mr. Stenzel. Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Olson, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. That's yeah, so just wondering right. if at this point in time, if we have any um, understanding or any predictions of, you know, the amount of revenue or profit that this facility will generate and if it will be able to, um, you know, kind of sustain itself in the future? Or? Sure, sure. Um, right now we're in the middle of negotiations on the, on the contracts. So I can't really speak to the contract, okay. but the facility itself, the, the, the uh, actual design uh, is designed for around a two to two and a half million dollar uh, facility um, in return. So taking a previous concession and actually building something that um, has the capacity, storage capacity, kitchen capacity, seating capacities that maybe wasn't there at the old one, that was one of the criteria when we put the plan together was to increase revenues mm -hmm. so regardless of tenant that is the goal is to, to increase revenues through those um through those improvements awesome yeah i just want to you know make sure with any project like this when we're you know spending a ton of money on something new that um we we really are looking at you know not necessarily increasing our future maintenance costs or whatever without having a way to pay for it um because we do have a big system so appreciate that thank you yep. Any other questions? Not seeing any. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Okay, now where are we at now? Oh, recreation. 
who's doing recreation I today? Guess I shall do it. Oh, uh, great. Vice President Smith, go for it. All right. Um, I will move resolution 51-2022, resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the University of Minnesota Research Team in pursuit of the Parks and Recreation for Kids Park Study. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the item? Yes. Plenty. Okay. All right. <laughs> Vice President Smith, go for it. I have a couple of questions for the research team. Okay, I believe. Okay, Mr. Nelner, you're here. And is anybody else here from the U? Oh, I believe so. Good evening, President Forney and commissioners. Um, we, Simone French is back again tonight. She was here with us last month. She is the principal investigator for the study. We have also invited all of the research team to join us so they will be able to respond directly to your questions if it falls within their domain. So please, we invite your questions and feedback. Awesome, Simone, welcome. All right, uh, are they coming up forward or am I just asking to an imaginary person? <laughs> Yeah, why don't you guys come up forward so that at least you're accessible for questions. Go for it. Okay, so first an easy question. There's a lot of reference to the language in which the information will be transferred or translated, excuse me, and it only reference uh, Spanish and English. Is there a reason why we're lacking the other languages spoke in these communities? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't hear the first part of the question. I, I heard that it's only offered in English. The second language that it's offered in is Spanish. Yeah. And that's due to affordability. We just have money to translate it into one language. And, and based on our work with a previous study, Spanish speakers were the main um, people who were interested in enrolling in another s study before this, and that was the basis of the choice. If we had an unlimited budget, we would translate it into all languages that were uh, int people were interested in participating in. But it was we don't have unlimited funds, so we chose Spanish. Got it. I understand. Money can be tight, hence why people need support in community to do programs. So my other question is, the last time you were here, when we talked about this and I asked for the infograph kind of explaining what would happen, there was a failure to mention the little uh, data tracker device that will be possibly hip to a young person or their family. Can I get more explanation on what will be the purpose? What information will actually be captured by this wireless Bluetooth device that is proposed to go into families in exchange for $70? Stipend. Um, yes, Vice President Smith. Um, I did bring a copy of an example of the device is called an actograph accelerometer. And we actually will not be enabling the Bluetooth. And so what it does will pick up the intensity level of the physical activity because that's one of our main outcomes. So we all know that physical activity has lots of health benefits. And so we want to see whether or not the children who are enrolled in the program, that they're actually able to increase their physical activity. And so we'll be looking at whether or not the amount of time they're spent in sedentary um, activity, light, moderate, and vigorous activity. We're not able to um, track, we won't be able to track where they are or, um, yeah, we won't be able to track where they are. It moves on like a forward, backward, up and down in the Z plane in terms of capturing the amount of activity. And the device itself is placed on the waist um, and um, participants will be told during the consent process if for some reason they don't want to wear it, they do not have to wear it, everything is voluntary. But um, this is always a question. So I'm a physical activity epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota. So I get this question a lot. I've been using this for many years. There's always the concern because it is a device and whether or not it's going to track locations of children or whoever is wearing it. But I assure you we are not um, enabling those capabilities. And it's strictly about how much activity the children are getting. So we will see whether or not they increase their activity or decrease their activity from being involved in the program. And so by not turning on the, the Bluetooth component of it, is that a thing that you all manually control or is that something that's controlled digitally somewhere else? 
Oh, when we are, so the way that this device works is that we have to, what we call initialize it. And so that's to set it up so it can start to collect data. And when you're initializing it, because some people are really interested in like the proximity of, of activity um, and that you can enable it, but we do not enable that capability at all for this device. And so it's not anything that we can turn on at a later date. It has to be turned on when you initialize the device and we do not use that um, is just not necessary for this study. We're not interested in where they are active. We just want to see how active the children are. Okay. And if they don't wear the device, they can still participate in a study. Will they be compensated with the $70 since they're not wearing the device? Yeah, okay. No. The study, the primary outcome of the study, the whole uh, endpoint that it's funded for is physical activity. So physical activity has to be measured and reported in the study. That's the main outcome. <clears throat> so people will have to, if they, they will need to wear the accelerometer if they want to participate in the study. If they don't want to wear it and don't want to participate, then they don't have to. And I just want to clarify that this, we're recruiting participants in the neighborhoods around the rec centers. It's not, they're not going to be, um, required if they're participating in a rec center program that's a separate thing we're not going to just be saying oh you can't participate in a program uh, unless you enroll in this study so people can enroll in the study if they want to they may not even be participating in the rec center programming in their neighborhood or they might but the study part of it uh, they need to be interested in doing that as a separate activity and we'll be recruiting them to the study so if they don't want to do an accelerometer they won't enroll in the study they won't participate but it'll be clear to them in the consent process that we talked about last time that um, they it's a voluntary study and they'll be explained everything about the device and we're also doing a survey with the parent and we have one for the child so they don't have to do that either if they don't want to but they can skip survey questions if they don't want to answer some of the survey questions because the survey isn't the main whole reason for the study. It's co collecting additional information, but the accelerometry is the main outcome of the study. So if people enroll in the study, we're going to want them to wear that. But they can decide later that they don't want to wear it, and then that's their choice. So it's really up to them. But initially, we're going to be enrolling people and wanting them to wear this over the course of two years. I, um, at the beginning of the study and then three other times throughout the two years. So if they enroll and then they start in the study and then they say, I don't really want to do this anymore, they don't have to. And then that's the end of it. So it's really up to them if they want to participate and then if they want to drop out later, they can do that. Okay. So you said two years. That's, I'll, I'll come back to that question. So you're saying that the participants that you're looking to wear the uh, the accelerometer are the, the young people or families that are not enrolled in the park programming? They, they could be or they might be or they might not be. We're not, we're not recruiting them because of their participation or non-participation in a park program. We're just recruiting them because they live around the neighborhood. So we're going through community organizations, neighborhood associations, uh, other community organizations like YMCA, YWCA, there were partners with us in the grant proposal, churches, whatever organizations in the neighborhood serve that community and are willing to work with us to invite people to take part in this study. Okay, and so the compensation of $70 for the seven days, that's every time they wear it the four times over the course of Two years? Yes. Okay. And you will not, your team would not be directly responsible for recruiting. What you would do is leverage the relationships of these said partner organizations to recruit the families in. Is that correct? Well, it's usually a joint activity. I mean, we are responsible because we have the staff to do it, and these organizations are busy, so they're not out there recruiting people for us. We just 
we ask them to share things in their newsletters if they have an email newsletter to put the information there and if people are interested they can text us or email us or call us we have a designated um, contact number and we have a study website they can go there so the organizations are just basically sharing information with their communities and their networks they don't really do more than that all right um i will let someone else ask some questions i have several more also i'll come back to them okay commissioner uh, just a reminder we do have a time certain um uh, hearing at 6 30. go for it thank you president forney i'll be brief uh in the updated document we, re we received today uh, i noted that this is uh, a, pro a project to determine the activity level of children and their families will adults also be um, participating in the accelerometer component of the study so you can see whether or not there is some um, uh, corollary data to p parents also becoming more active as their children do at the same time? Yes, we're, we're in, in order to enroll a child in the study, their parent has to consent and um, take part also. So we're, re we're recruiting and enrolling a p at least one of the parent or caregivers of the child and the child. So they'll enroll together. They'll both uh, go through a consent process where they explain the study is explained to them and <clears throat> both the parent and the child wear the accelerometer around their waist for seven days and they also are both asked a survey that asks them some questions about park use and their attitudes towards park what makes it easy what makes it harder to participate in park programs those kinds of questions Kids are eligible for the study if they're between 6 and 12, but we only ask a child to complete a survey if they're 8 or older just because of their ability to kind of focus and answer the questions. But it's an age-appropriate survey, and both the parent and the child do wear the accelerometer. Okay, thank you for that information. I, I just... I always am curious when we're trying to influence the behavior of children or understand what influences the behavior of children, what impacts that has on, on the adults in their lives. So I'm glad to hear that it's, a, it's comprehensive in that way as well. Thank you. Any more questions, people? Oh, Catherine, uh, Commissioner Benny. I have a quick question, and I, it might have been in the packet materials. I didn't print the whole thing. But what, what department is this a study in? Or are you a part of? This um, study is being condu conducted through the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health. That's a, we call them divisions. They're just like departments. It's in the School of Public Health. But our co-investigators, uh, Dr. Barr Anderson is in kinesiology, as she mentioned, and she's a physical activity epidemiologist. And Dr. Fan is in the Humphrey School of Public Policy. She's an urban planner and has worked with the parks before. Well, and I, thank you for that answer. And that's a, I think that's what I was remembering, that it was public health, a broad umbrella with this community piece. But, but I think that why, why I'm going to support this is that um, there was, when I was campaigning, some people were interested in um, the parks taking on um, kind of responsibility for public health. But I think it's a partnership. Um, you know that we you know we can offer and do support support public health work and studies and and learning um, and then try to leverage what what's learned as we roll out uh, programs for in this case kids so thank you so much vice president smith and we've only got a couple minutes before hearing okay uh, again i'm going back to the document um, that lists your measures um, be sick B6, um, specifically when it talks about the actograph, it talks about GPS tracking and the location where the physical activity occurs for these families. That is, again, alarming and very concerning to me. And so I heard that you won't be using it, but it's written in your grant report. So I'm literally confused. Yeah. Um, yes, President Forney, Vice President Smith. Um, yes, we are. So Simone was saying how it was in the grant. Um, so the proposal. Sometimes we have these 
um, ideas of how we're going to do things in the study and then when it's time to actually do the study we make the final decisions and I um, assure you we are not doing we are not using that GPS capabilities for measuring physical activity for this study it is purely just their activity level and being able to classify and being able to do the same for the parents and make that comparison. Totally um, understand and hear like that that's very concerning, um, particularly uh, of, of tracking um, unless that's the agreement, but that's not, um, it's just not one of the aims of the study. We're just on physical activity and not about the proximity and the context of where physical activity is taking place. I appreciate your answer. I am still very concerned. It is what's written. Um, and in, in true fashion, it's actually written. And the University <sighs> of Minnesota has a very dark history in communities of color and communities that are focused in or placed in areas of high concentrated poverty, one in which there's been just kind of a switch and bait, if you will. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned. Well, I understand your concern and I agree with your perspective and I, I I've know some about what's happened over the decades of um, abuse by researchers. I mean, that's, that's, I acknowledge that. I hear what you're saying. I understand your concern and the community's concern. The grant proposal has, uh, when you're writing a grant proposal, you put in a lot of things in there and then it's an idea and, and the reviewers review it and it gets funded. Then when you have to get down to the super in the weeds, sometimes you don't do things the way that's written because you either can't or there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't exactly map on. So there's a lot of things in there that are going to be done differently <clears throat> than is written in that document. And we, the GPS thing is one of the things that we are not doing. I don't know what else to say to reassure you that we're not doing it other than to let you know that we aren't doing it because it's not a name, as Dr. Bar Anderson said, it's not a name of the study and it doesn't really, it's not of interest to us. So, and it's a lot more effort to put that in there for something that we have no interest in. So we aren't doing that. And if we were going to do it, you can bet it would be in the consent form, but also you can bet people would never participate. I wouldn't, if I was gonna be tracked by a GPS in any study, whether it was a physical activity study or any study, I would never do that. So. I, I, I apologize, but we do have a time oh. certain here, we, so we need to recess the full board. I'm sorry, uh, we need, if you guys can sit down, we need to go to another committee, and we'll come back to this after we've done, um, so um, on to the planning committee for their um, uh, public hearing. Uh, take it away, yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to call the planning committee to order, noting our two new um, members. Secretary, could you take the roll, please? Vice President Smith. Here. Commissioner Schaefer. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Menz. Here. President Forney. Here. Co-Chair Benny. Here. Co-Chair Alper. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next, let's... Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Uh, the motion passes. I believe we have no minutes. So I'm going to move right into the public hearing and invite um, design project manager Andy Schilling, if you'd like to give us a brief presentation. Please. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Andy Schilling, design project manager for the Columbia Park Playground replacement of removed equipment concept plan effort. Um, the background and location of this project is it's um, um, this project is uh, the replacement of playground equipment in the two to five age play area um, in Columbia Park. Um, this playground container was impacted in 2020 
um, by a joint project called the North Columbia Golf Course and Park Stormwater BMPs project. Um, you can see on this slide that there was a, a stormwater pipe that went right through the two to five age playground container. Um, the equipment that was in there um, had reached its effective life, um, so uh, the replacement was was imminent. A little a bit of imagery of that particular container. Uh, the image on the left was the playground equipment, um, and uh, the ship theme kind of persists through what I'll be presenting tonight. And I uh, just wanted to show that. On the right hand side is the restored playground container. Um, by the, the stormwater BMPs project, um, and we swapped out um, some of the playground surfacing with um, more of the preferred, from sand to the preferred uh, engineered wood fiber surfacing. Uh, funding for this project uh, comes from the 2022 Capital Improvement Program, MPB 20, uh, for 150,000 um, with some of the engagement staff time um, and other fees uh, and costs. We have about approximately 136,000 uh, for construction and contingency. Timeline for this project, um, we began to engage the, the community and uh, began a design development in October of 2021 and, um, and proceeded through that process until April this year. Uh, tonight we have the public hearing and concept approval um, with, with the approval, we'd be able to execute the construction contract in May or June of 2022 um, and, and start building, the, uh, installing the equipment this summer. Uh, in terms of community engagement, we uh, I reached out to, um, in part of, as part of the plan, to the neighborhood group, uh, the Columbia Park Neighborhood Association. We had three neighborhood group meetings, including an open house in December. Um, where we introduced a couple different concepts for playground equipment um, and gathered feedback through that process as well as surveys, as well as a survey um, to really land on a concept plan um, and, and preferred concept plan through that process. I also had MPRB staff input and um, we reviewed with the neighborhood in February a preferred concept which uh, required very minor changes um, that uh, You'll see tonight with the preferred concept includes those changes. Uh, the playground concept uh, that's preferred is a pirate ship themed play element. Um, and it also includes uh, with some community feedback, uh, toddler swings with a shared parent child swing, um, a playhouse with, with a tunnel, a spinner or merry-go-round type setup, as well as sensory and imaginative play features and accessibility features um, in the project. Uh, so the, the surfacing for the playground would be a combination of the engineered wood fiber that's in place, as well as pour in place rubber um, uh, features for the accessibility piece and some of the resiliency in, in high use areas. Here are a couple images of the playground equipment and uh, the you can see the pirate theme on the right uh, it's, it was very popular. We had feedback down to you know, specific elements within it. It has two steering wheels or helms that, uh, that was a requirement from the previous one, had that same setup and, and was popular. Um, and you can see the tunnel and playhouse area that has um, sensory elements as well, the spinner and uh, the toddler swings with the parent-child um, joint swing as well. Another angle of that image. And that is all. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Okay, uh, Vice President Smith. Uh, I do have a question. Um, in the, the drawing or the design here, is there any way that we can incorporate some accessibility piece for young people who may be chair bound to access the swings? Yes, so um, actually that, that full engineered wood fiber um, surfacing is ADA accessible. Uh, it's a very specific type of wood fiber blend to be able to make that happen. So those swings would be accessible um, from a ramp that'll be coming off of one side of the container. The, the side of the container that they'll be able to access will be um, on the near the pirate ship side. Okay, got it. 
Awesome. That's all I wanted to make sure. Yep. Nope. Thank you. And just, I, uh, we do have one speaker here tonight on this. So what I'll do is I'm going to um, invite our speaker to come up. Uh, I believe it's Sue Bembank, if I said your name correctly. And then we'll come back and if there's any further discussion um, by commissioners before we, um, on this item. So Sue, if you'd like to come up and let's say. I don't think I'm going to need to add anything to oh. it. I thought it was a kind of a different structured meeting tonight that we'd see a bit more hands on. Um, but from what I see, it seems like it will serve our neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood. And uh, I guess I would like to see if I can still add a thought, something musical. There is a park, Jackson Park, off of Central Avenue and 22nd that has some components to it since we're doing two to five. I don't know if you can still add something like that. Um, but otherwise, uh, it looks like it will meet the needs of our neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I'm gonna close the public hearing and return to uh, um, commissioner comments on this. Any, any other questions? Yes, co-chair Benny. Just a comment, you have the, sen the sensory equipment or the, sen um, yeah, experience. Um, I just really appreciate that and, um, and I noticed in another presentation that we had the last time or the time before from another, um, you know, playground equipment uh, project, uh, that's the case. Is it typical in all playground um, remodels to add that type of feature? Uh, yes, that's, that's, that tends to come with kind of the standards that we try to bring to a project um, to have not just kind of the physical physical activity and, and motor, big motor skills, but also some of the, the sensory and imaginative play. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further lights, um, I'm gonna ask if there's a motion on this, uh, this item from so the So moved. Committee. Can I move it, if I'm a yes. guest? Yes, please. Please move the whole thing. Well, I got to get this going. I moved to the public hearing. No. No. Are we moving it? Wait a minute. Oh, we're moving. It's the next item oh, agenda. Okay. Do we have to skip the public hearing? It's not 6.45 yet. No, okay. No. So I would like to move resolution 2022-187, resolution approving the concept plan for Columbia Park Playground replacement of removed equipment. Okay. Second. A second. A second. No. All right. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The concept, that resolution passes. President you, Forney, we're four minutes. You can go ahead and, and we can have, have the presentation. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. All right. So next, um, I would like to invite Carrie Christensen to, to the podium. Um, if you could share uh, some background information for us first on resolution 2022-8, um, public hearing to consider the name Bridal Veil Gardens for the Towerside Park site. Please go ahead. All right, good evening. Thank you, co-chairs, commissioners, President Forney. Um, so tonight I'm excited to be opening up at long last a public hearing for a new park name and the Towerside uh, site, for the Towerside site is which the, the way we've been referring to it over the past few years. So um, as, you, uh, as you know, the board, the previous board nominated uh, this name, Bridal Veil Gardens. Um, tonight is the first of two public hearings that we'll be holding to uh, hear from community about the name nomination. Uh, there is no action required for the board tonight. Um, and then this summer, the plan is to bring it back to you as a resolution to take action uh, to name the park. So um, just to orient everyone to where the park is located, it's in the Prospect Park neighborhood. This graphic shows the Bridal Veil sub watershed, which actually empties out into the Mississippi River at Bridal Veil Falls, but there's unbeknownst to many of us, a creek kind of flowing under um, much of it's a pipe shed, but 
so this story is really telling the story of this ecological feature that's really significant um, to this area. The star represents the location of the park. Um, the park was master planned. It was one of the newer parks in our system. It was master planned and is part of the East of the River master plan. Um, this is the, the tower, tower side district as we refer to it. Um, and you can see the park it's kind of down in the bottom part of the screen. The first, I'd say the first segment or first park in this district. We hope to actually be bringing other um, park, new parks in this district to you in the next few months. So stay tuned. And then here's a, a graphic of the master plan before it was built. So we actually built this park um, just not, not too long ago. And here's what it looks like. Um, really urban, interesting context, a lot of higher density housing, um, but also a, adjacent to this industrial area. Um, so there's a picnic shelter it's adjacent to a, a watershed, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization stormwater facility. And you actually, we get to water the community garden on the site with um, filtered stormwater. So it's this really amazing kind of system. All of the buildings surrounding the stormwater park, their roofs flow into the stormwater park, are treated and then used in our park to water the grass and the garden. There's the very popular, much coveted tower side site for now, um, community garden. The site before it was made into a park board park was the Prospect Park Community Garden. So it was this really kind of community driven um, grassroots space for many years until we took it over. Been working closely with community on this site for, for years. Um, and just a little more about the, the context. So again, it's in the Bridalvale subwatershed. Um, there's lots of names tossed around with this area. So uh, the developer that we purchased the park from had referred to it as the Towerside Signature Green Space. As I mentioned, Prospect Park Community Gardens was the name of the original community garden on the site. Malcolm Yards is how the developer of the area across the transit way refers to the future development area. The Towerside Innovation District is the name of the district. That's a collaboration between lots of agencies. Uh, people, sort of the vernacular for the grain silos um, on the edge of this area is the United Crushers. Green Fourth is the name of the street going next to the park that was this multi-agency effort. Um, and then from Park Board's perspective, in the East of the River Master Plan, we did name the future regional trail that will be, it's basically the Grand Rounds Missing Link connecting from the river up to St. Anthony Parkway. Um, that we are, we've entitled the Bridal Vale Regional Trail. And so um, this park will be one of the parks along that trail route. There's been lots of engagement, again, many years of conversations about the name, starting with the master plan. So in 2017 to 19, when we were planning, we also collected name ideas. Um, we shared multiple name options from the master plan with the community during the design process for the park, which happened just on the heels of the master plan. Um, lots of, you know, we had in-person engagements, an online survey, we even did some intercept interviews with LRT riders. There's a light rail station right across the, the street with community gardeners, with students, neighborhood organization. Um, and then we revisited some of the name ideas in 2000 and 21 at the direction of the previous board, had conversations with local leadership um, and garden and park users. So here's a list of names that were considered for nomination. Um, and the list here represents names that came up multiple times. Um, so Bridal Bell Gardens. And then I'm gonna give a little bit of background on why the name didn't move ahead as the primary nomination. Um, so I'm sort of fast forwarding along here, which Malcolm Yards was one of the names that came up, but again, it's a developer name for the area that now has a food hall um, and a future park location. Prospect Park North, um, since there are other parks in Prospect Park, there was a sense that this might be confusing. Um, Towerside Park, which duplicates the word tower and may be confused with Tower Hill nearby. Uh, Mary Alice, Alice Cop Park or Garden, other memorial efforts are underway in the community to memorialize her. Um, a name of significance for Dakota people. There's been communication between Towerside Innovation District and the tribal leadership around this idea. 
and the site was not determined as a priority for the Dakota community at that time. Um, there was also a few nominations or sort of recommendations to honor the African American family who lived in the Prospect Park neighborhood in the early 1900s that faced discrimination, the Jackson family. Um, and there are other memorial efforts underway currently in the community um, for that family as well. And then there was other sort of recommendations, which don't, please don't include the word tower in the name, so it doesn't get confused, confused with Tower Hill, and then please um, you know, honor this idea of it being a garden or a park. So the, the previous board gave some guidelines for as we sort of started to winnow or go back out to, to re-engage about the name since it had been a few years, um, they directed staff that the name should not have the word tower. Um, the name should relate to a local geographic feature like Bridalville Creek or Garden. The name should tell an underrepresented story of people or places in the area and that it should not duplicate other memorial efforts underway in the community. So sort of through that process of elimination, we've landed at Bridalville Gardens, brought that forward to the last board again, and it was presented as the nomination. Um, and I think this list sort of speaks for itself in terms of the justification for that name. So thank you so much. I think now we'll open it up. Yes, so um, what I would like to do this time, I, I'm a little more uh, prepared than at 6.30 for that public hearing. What I'd like to do is open the public hearing. We have one speaker tonight and we have three written comments. And if our secretary Ringgold would be so kind as to um, when the time comes after our in-person speaker would read uh, aloud the written comments and then we'll close the public hearing and then we'll have any um, commissioner discussion. Okay, so I would like to start by inviting, um, we have one speaker who's signed up, Julia Wallace, if you could come forward. I'd like to invite you to speak and if you could just state your name and address for the record. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, three whole minutes, wow, that's more than I thought I would get. Um, my name is Julia Wallace and I live at 22 Malcolm Avenue Southeast, which is one block from this wonderful little park. Uh, I'm here to speak in support of the name Bridal Vale Gardens. During the work leading up to the East of the River Master Plan, I served on the work group which worked on the regional trail, which will complete, and I said will, not might, will complete the Grand Rounds missing link through Northeast and Southeast Minneapolis. The Master Plan names this final link the Bridal Vale Trail. Uh, as the master plan states, Bridalvale Creek used to be a prominent feature within the area, moving through many wetlands, ponds, and finally over the Bridalvale Falls into the Mississippi River. We in Prospect Park are familiar with the Bridalvale Falls and we recognize it as a landmark, but many people don't understand that there is a creek that feeds that falls and there is the watershed, so this will be a learning opportunity. Um, uh, establishing park names that recognize historic and natural resources is a way not only of honoring those, but of informing people and educating us. So we look forward to that. The Bridal Vale name will mark the first new parkland along the Bridal Vale Trail. The master plan states in its discussion of this future park at the Towerside Green Space uh, site, there is a potential for common branding of all the public spaces and park features in the Towerside District and Malcolm Yards. Uh, that can, uh, we really see that as a, a way of making connections, which is one of the things that Parks for All talks about, is connecting parks and people, and this will have a trail connecting a lot of parks, and we hope that having some branding of those parks uh, will, uh, uh, will improve their access. The include, inclusion of the word gardens, of course, is especially important to the neighborhood. Uh, before the park board even became involved, this site was the home of a flour, of flourishing community gardens uh, run by the Prospect Park community, um, made successful by the support of the landlord uh, and the hard work of dedicated neighborhood gardeners who made it quite a wonderful, kind of funky place. Um, that also was used for community gatherings. Um, 
When the plans were being made for this space to become an official park, there was strong support for including gardens, and that obviously happened. The vegetable and flower gardens in this park are one of its signature features, and the name Bridalvale Gardens is a recognition of this special element of our park. So we can't wait to have this process completed and to see that sign go up this summer that says Bridalvale Gardens. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Ringgold, would you be willing to read aloud the comments that we received? Yes, I will. Co-chair Elper. Um, so the first one is from Trina Port. I live a block away from the gardens next to 2900 Fourth Street Southeast, and I already, and I really hope that you do not choose the name Bridalville Gardens for several reasons. It has nothing to do with the wonderful free fresh produce and flowers that are a big part, big and important part of this garden. There are no bridal veil plants in it. That's a specific kind of flowering shrub, spirea, and it smells awful too. Bridal veil is a sexist term and has nothing to do with the fact that most of this garden is used for fresh vegetables and cutting flowers. How about a name that is specific to the gifts of our neighborhood like Be Happy Garden, Giving Garden, Garden of Neighborly Love, etc. Thank you for your work and I really hope another name is chosen. <coughs> Next is from Mary um, Britton. The part of Prospect Park referring, referred to as Bridal Vale Falls is nowhere near this park. It will cause confusion. Towerside Park is a good name and relevant. And finally, from Farmer Dell, while the idea of a name honoring the Native American heritage is intriguing, I am fine with Bridalville Gardens. It ties to the Bridalville Trail concepts and highlights the fact that there is a food and pollinator gardening emphasis at this site. Wonderful, thank you. So with that, I would we'll close the public hearing. And if there are any questions for Carrie or comments, um, now's the time. Let's go to Commissioner Menz. Um, I've had, I actually had a campaign event at this spot um, with Julie there, and there was lots of discussion. And the, the consensus is that that's a, it is a nice name to brand the area, and the naming of the trail is important. So as the commissioner in this district, I'm supportive of this name. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Benny. Just a quick question. I mean, I know there was Bridal Vale Creek. Um, it's all been piped. I think all of it's in the pipe. Or is there still any daylighted remnant of creek? Is there a water body named Bridal Vale Creek? Um, Commissioner Benny, I, I believe that their creek is gone, is in the pipes and then upstream at Casota is some relation to it. And then Bridal Vale Falls, sorry? Bridal Vale Pond is Okay. Well, is, is, is a body of water that is upstream. But, but there I, is no you know, more Bridal Vale Creek right now. It's in a pipe. It could come out of a pipe at some point, but it's currently in a pipe. Let's see if my colleague, Tyler Pedersen, no, no. has any. Complete. Yep. Do, you have, do you know any, do you have any insights? We've been, we've been looking at the Bridal Vale Pond for another project, so. Uh, commissioners, I, 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 I'm actually mistaken. It's actually Casota Pond, but it is br the Bridalville Creek comes through there, and it, it is daylighted so, yeah. for about a few hundred feet. Okay, so it may be a water body. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Okay, seeing no further lights, I'm going to continue on to our uh, study report item tonight. Um, and then after that, well, that, that's our final item for the planning committee. And then I believe we'll go back to the full board. I just want to let the, the, the um, researchers in the back know. So um, I would like to invite Assistant Superintendent Schroeder up and Tyler um, Pedersen to talk about a property exchange between the University of Minnesota and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. It's uh, Resolution 2022-14. Thank you, Commissioner Alper, Commissioners. Um, uh, I will um, give a very brief introduction. I'm going to take you back to uh, the previous board and resolution 2021-204, uh, 
which was approved by uh, the previous board on the 19th of May, 2021. And it involves a project at Fraser Hall on the campus of the University of Minnesota on the East Bank campus, um, where the, um, the uh, board approved mm -hmm. what we call a letter of agreement that allowed the University of Minnesota to proceed with the planning for uh, the reconstruction of Fraser Hall. As we're going through that process, we noted that there were, there were other uh, encroachments, not just at Fraser Hall, but at Brunix Hall and Appleby Hall, and I believe the ones at Appleby Hall were, were undocumented encroachments. And, and as we move through that process, we realized that with the kinds of improvements that the university was necessarily making to support its buildings, um, we would never be able to fairly use that land, that part, that, that the current parkland, for any other use. It's basically the area between uh, the easterly curb line of East River Road and the buildings. And so we uh, talked uh, through the letter of agreement about an eventual land swap, a land exchange that would exchange equal amounts of land, um, finding land that would be better suited for park purposes. So tonight we're going to go through that process of describing what we believe is a reasonable exchange of, of land between the University of Minnesota um, and, and the Park Board. Um, this is preliminary. It's also being shared with the Board of Regents. Um, and we expect to, if, if, the, if these properties seem to be acceptable to, to, the, to the Board, we'll be doing due diligence through uh, uh, more definitive surveys and an environmental review of each site, um, and then expecting to come back with an actual exchange uh, proposal in the, probably the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of the following year. Um, to give this uh, a timeline, we're actually moving through this fairly quickly. The previous board was quite generous in giving us three years to accomplish this. We're hoping to accomplish this by the, hopefully by the beginning of uh, 2023. Um, I'll note that uh, Andrew Caddick from the University of Minnesota Planning Division is here as well. He, he's been uh, instrumental in helping us identify uh, properties on the university campus that would be suitable. But Tyler will walk through the uh, proposed lands. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good evening, co-chairs of Benny and uh, uh, Elper and commissioners. Uh, as Michael just mentioned, I'll be giving a little brief presentation on the uh, land exchange. Uh, but first, I'm going to start off at uh, the Grand Rounds, uh, talk a little bit about that and two sites that will help us build um, access that's necessary to creating uh, new, co new connections along uh, its missing link. Um, So Michael mentioned the, uh, the 2021 letter agreement. Um, there's a quote in there that says, uh, um, we want to affirm uh, the intent to exchange property in areas where each party has uh, the need to acquire, use, or access the property of the other to accomplish future improvements, including the NPRB's plans to complete the missing link. So these two pieces are very important to us. And I'll go through them in uh, a few moments in a little bit more detail. Um, the university is also doing a little bit more work uh, at Fraser Hall, as Michael had just mentioned, um, and so we're working through um, uh, uh, that portion of it um, and uh, making sure that they're able to do their work um, and uh, make it easy on, on both parties. Um, so the land swaps. Um, so this is a, a pretty simple acre for acre swap. Um, uh, and it's going to benefit uh, both parties. Um, the staff considered many options over the last nine month, months and recommended um, uh, the proposed uh, based on the following criteria. Uh, we wanted it to align with adopted policies and plans, which it does. Um, uh, we want it to be consistent with previous agreements and extensive staff engagement between the parties, uh, reduce administrative burdens of both parties, um, and uh, we don't want it to displace existing uses for either party, and we want it to reflect uh, existing conditions and land uses. So the chart on the, or the uh, table on the, on the right-hand side, um, it, it, it kind of uh, funnily uh, equaled both uh, 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 pieces of, of property. Um, site A is at 0.7 acres, and B at 0.28. Uh, both of those are uh, park board properties um, that would be, uh, go to the, the, the university, and then C and D are um, university, pro or, excuse, uh, university properties that would go to the park board. 
Um, here's a, a kind of a big map of all of them. Um, uh, basically, the two that would go from the park board to the university are near uh, the East River Parkway. And then um, C and D are uh, more interior to the, the, the university's property area and uh, would go to the park board. And again, those are lined up um, very nicely with the, uh, the, the Grand Rounds Missing Link Corridor. Uh, so Site A um, is right in front of uh, Brunix, Appleby, and a uh, little bit of Fraser Hall. Uh, again, it's 0.7 acres. Um, currently right now there is um, uh, kind of a pedestrian ramp that takes you from East River Parkway to, I believe it's Pleasant Street. Um, and that is within um, this area. And then in front of Brunix Hall, there is kind of a, kind of a seating area and walkway. Um, both publicly accessible. Um, and here's just a few kind of street shots of it. Um, you can see there's a, a parking lot that'll change a little bit with uh, the Fraser Hall work, um, and then the, uh, the pedestrian ramp, um, and then the uh, kind of the seating area in front of Brunix Hall. So that's site A. Site B is Harvard Street South, uh, 0.2 acres, uh, 0.28 acres. Uh, this would go from the park board to the university. It's one of those little random stubs um, uh, that, that kind of just ended up in, in park board hands. Um, it is uh, a pretty basic, normal streetscape. Uh, it is not really a park. Um, so we found that, was, that would be a good one to uh, swap out. Um, and uh, there's, no, there's no planned park uh, for this area in any of our master plans. Um, and here's the site um, under construction during this photo, but uh, now completed, I believe. Um, it's just a street. And then uh, site C uh, that would go from the university to the park board, um, a nice uh, uh, relatively wide or wide enough uh, swath of land for um, a trail to be placed on. Um, this is adjacent to um, some of their uh, um, ancillary buildings, not necessarily, you know, uh, classes, I don't believe. Uh, there's some fleet services, things like that. Um, and um, this is kind of a, a picture of it. So it's, it's basically just a treed boulevard, um, perfect for a park. Um, and then site D, the last one here, is over by um, what might be Bridalville Gardens. Um, that you just le just learned about, um, but uh, uh, so you can see the gardens there on the south side, and the university um, is allowing us to take some of their land um, that would be really beneficial to us uh, for crossing um, and and being adjacent to um, that transit way um, that would support um, a trail uh, for Grand Rounds. Um, so it's 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 really great for for local connections. There is a proposed. Uh, plan for the site north of here. Um, so having that connection would be really fantastic, um, uh, being a park connection. And here's a photo of that now. Currently it's pretty basic transit way with the trail on it. Um, and then uh, the park space there as well. Thank you. And uh, myself and Michael and Andrew Caddick are available for questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. I saw Commissioner Menz's light first. Please go ahead. Tyler, Tyler, that's really great. I feel like, Julie, I feel like you're winning the lottery today. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> more space for the for the grand rounds, too. This is terrific. I just think it really should be commended when, 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 the, um, when the planning department does the little things, and it just is so big. So thank you for doing a good job. Just finding those spots, finding digging, and finding those places where we can work on that long-term stuff that will eventually get done. Thank you. All right, President Forney, I think that's your light. Thank you, um, oh, Chair. Um, oh, for, yes, totally exciting. Um, so <laughs> we mentioned that this is a part of the Bridal Vale uh, Trail. Is that what it'll be possibly named or you know, aligning with, or is it really more the Grand Rounds or 
uh, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to put it all in, into context and everything. Um, oh, wow, look at everybody just leaps. I love it. <laughs> Co-chair Alper and President Forney, we have been, uh, if, if you recall from the master plan, the East River master plan, it defines a preferred route, and we've been working at assembling land for that. And working with the university, we were able to identify pieces of land, particularly from the north, up near the university services facility, just off of Como, where it does align with our preferred alignment for the Grand Rounds Missing Link, or what might become Bridal Vale uh, Regional Trail. This is so exciting. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good to see you in Park Headquarters again. All right, that's all. Woohoo! Co-Chair Benny. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. And um, I know the, 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 the piece in the Como area, uh, and there are nice trees in there. We heard earlier about trees. If there's any way that, then that's a fairly wide street right of way in there, that the trees could be retained and any kind of trail um, facility could be actually on street pavement instead. I'm just putting it out there. You don't have to answer that now, but those are some nice trees along there that I think the university's taken really good care of, so. Yeah, uh, Co-Chair Benny, I, I would agree with you. Um, you know, we, we don't want to mess too much with the character there. We want to kind of make it blend. Okay, seeing no further questions or comments from commissioners, I am going to adjourn the planning committee meeting. Thank you. I'm going to reconvene then the um, uh, our board meeting. And first of all, I have to apologize. Simone, you, you, you catch us at these stops and starts. We're so uh, apologize for it and everything. But um, back to um, the recreation um, resolution. I believe that Vice President Smith, you might have been, um, were you finished with your, 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 your questions? Oh, OK. Oh. Did anybody else have any more? You do? I do. Oh, OK. Go for it. Just one. One final question. Uh, so that final question is uh, regarding the um, the actor meter uh, and what happens if a family misplaces it? Like, what is the obligation there? If they misplace it, what happens if a family loses the meter? What what? Oh, that's just we just have a lost device. They're not expected to replace it or um, make any type of payment. Um, we expect to lose some accelerometers as kind of part of the data collection process. And so we ca account for that. Okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner um, Elper. Thanks. Thanks. I'm excited for this work. And I, I um, just want to ask and confirm, I should say, that, that your research has gone through um, uh, I'm, I'm sure rigorous standards to make sure that we're not harming participants and um, I see you nodding and I believe it's through the uh, Institutional Review Board is that right IRB okay maybe maybe you could just speak briefly to that review um, just uh, that'd be great um, every uh, research study that's done at the university, including student research, has to be reviewed and approved by the IRB, which is a, a committee of people, including community members, serve um, to look at the risks and benefits and safety to participants. And um, they've reviewed it and approved it. In fact, it's considered low risk. so. Uh, that's what they, the label they put on it was low risk. So, but that review um, is very thorough and it's required and they also follow up. So any changes that we make in the study, uh, including in our recruitment methods or the payments we make or any of the process measures uh, has to be approved beforehand by that review board. We have to submit it, they all review it and they have to approve it or we can't do anything differently. Great, thank you. Commissioner Renz. Um, I know you mentioned in the, and it says that there's only two languages. What, what will be the opportunity for young people or families that don't speak those two languages to participate in the study? And will you have any sort of 
way to accommodate them? Uh, people who participate in the study must, in order to be eligible, they must speak Spanish or English because we have measures, survey measures and the consent process. We have to be able to communicate with them. They need to be able to participate in the study. So they have to be able to speak in those languages well enough to understand the consent form and complete the survey. The, the University of Minnesota is not allowing any sort of translation services, like phone translation? It costs or? A money to get things translated into other languages, so we would have to uh, translate all of the surveys, all of the consent forms, all of the everything. We would love to offer it in um, different languages because there are groups in the neighborhoods we're working who speak other languages. Typically what happens is that maybe the child might be able to or another family member might be able to help the, the person who doesn't speak English or Spanish complete the measures, but in order to enroll, that's just part of the study. And we're lucky, we're thankful that we could budget in the, the ability to offer it in Spanish. It's a budget thing, really. You, you, so you're not able to get phone consent with someone who speaks both languages. It has to all be translated into documents, is what you're saying. Because I know that, that at times I work with families and not everything is translated into different languages, but we obtain consent from those families for services for their children, even though everything's not completely translated in document form. Well, one thing that the IRB does is review all of our documents and we have to follow their procedures. So for consent, we have to have a uh, the consent form translated and we have to have somebody who speaks the language and be, be able to work with the participant to make sure that they understand what the study's about so they can decide if they want to participate. It's a written document and, you know, it takes 20 minutes to go through and walk through that. So. It's, I don't know what process you use, but the process that we use is, is following the IRB, the federal compliance um, protocols and language. And For study participation, okay. I, All right, it's a big limitation for me. Thank you. Do you have any more thing you want to say? Okay, great. Uh, not seeing any more lights and everything. All those uh, in favor of the motion, please. Um, Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, that motion does carry. I abstain too. I don't know if you asked for abstentions. Oh, okay. Abstentions. Okay. Thank you. you I apologize. Um, did we catch that, Secretary Ringel? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to standards and conduct. Uh, who is bringing forward that resolution? Ah. Commissioner Jens. I'd like to move resolution 2022-174 resolution approving that the Board of Commissioners commits to the regular recital of an Indigenous Land, People, and Nations Acknowledgement Statement at Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board meetings, and for that statement to evolve based on context, time, and place, and to take action on strategies to create a culture of Indigenous Land, People, and Nations Acknowledgement in MPRB work, procedures, and spaces as supported by Parks for All, the MPRB Comprehensive Plan. Is there a second? Okay, we have a second. All right. Um, any discussion on this matter, or we have an amendment, I believe? I'm not on that committee. I forgot. This is the full board. Full board. Oh, okay. Full board. Yeah, this is okay. the full board. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Music. Um, I had submitted an amendment mm -hmm. for inclusion in our packet, <laughs> but now I'm looking at the packet and I don't see it. Am I looking in the wrong place? Do you have it? I mean, I have it was in my email. Okay. Okay, thank you. I saw it earlier. Um, so, so I would like to propose 
No. I will move to, to amend what is before us, um, but to include two resolve clauses. And I will read those to you now. Um, resolve that the Board of Commissioners directs staff to issue a request for proposals to hire a local consultant slash advisor to facilitate the board working together in drafting a land acknowledgement statement at park headquarters and to establish a shared understanding of MPRB land acknowledgement practices. Second resolve clause. Resolve that an additional budget request for staff, training, and planning resources to support and take action on this work and the strategies outlined in Parks for All shall be drafted and presented to the board as part of the 2023 budget. Do I hear a second? Seconded. Thank you. Okay. So, um, discussion on that. Um, amendment. Commissioner Music? Oh, I don't have any discussion. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Any questions or concerns or... Um, Commissioner um, Schaefer. I have just a clarification. Um, if it's drafted and presented as part of the 2023 budget, if we are presented with what that looks like in more specifics, and it feels like it's too much or too involved or for some reason, is there, a, is there another place that we can adjust that or make changes? Mr. Mishich, do you want to address that? Sure. I believe it's a question directed to me. And, and so um, the amendment is not intended to dictate specifically what the board will adopt at that time. It's to request that something be brought to us so that we can make a decision at that time. So that, that's the intention of this. It's defining a little bit more intensely what it is we're trying to do and then also how we're going to get that done. Um, and what it'll cost us. Thank you. Oh, Welcome. sorry. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Alper? Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may add to what Commissioner Musich said, I think it's um, making sure that this uh, resolution is working towards action. And so um, um, that that second resolved clause is. Um, you know that we're putting we're working together to make excuse me in the first resolve clause we're working on a um, land acknowledgement statement and then in the second one we're, we're thinking about how to go beyond um, and what that might take we're not like like Commissioner Musich said we're not dictating what those actions are but we're 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 working towards action we'll put anybody else any discussion on this um, I, I support this too. I, 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 it's putting our money where our mouth is. So I, it's really what it comes down to. And, and I appreciate the amendment. And so um, all those in favor of the amendment, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Extensions, I guess I should say too. Okay, so um, that motion um, carries to the resolution. Any discussion to the amended resolution now? Any discussion on that? Commissioner um, Olson. Just real quick. Yep, this is a start. It's not the end. We got to do big, solid action. I'd love to see something around land. I'm going to keep saying that, returning it or creating some sort of partnership or giving duties to a native community. I don't know. Just we'll, we'll think about that as we go through it. But I do really like this. It's a great start. Thanks for uh, bringing this forward uh, and getting it rolling, Commissioner Menz. Commissioner Um I don't think it was me that got it rolling. I just started reading something. I'd like to ask, uh, Carrie, can you come? Can I ask you a question really quick? Um, I'm wondering if we need an amendment for this, but based on the community input today, I'm wondering about communication with the tribal councils and ensuring that that happens in a way that's authentic and not um, superficial. So uh, I don't know if we need an amendment, and maybe I'm asking for the board's um, direction here too. So I have an amendment, but I don't, it, it might just be part of the process, carry of what staff would do, resolve that this board directs staff to ensure any RFP or communication is directly done to the 11 tribal councils via phone conversation or in-person meeting. I don't know if that would be an appropriate amendment or if it just would be something that your office would do. 
Thank you, Chairmen, um, Commissioners. My, I just in quick consult with Director Arvidsson. I, I agree that I, that could be a, just a direction to staff in terms of how we would move through a process with issuing an RFP, which would be public part of our public procurement processes, and we'd widely distribute it. The plan was to distribute it to the 11 um, tribal councils of Minnesota, plus many other, you know, TMP list um, with the City of Minneapolis. Um, any relevant consultants that you know will reach out widely. So, um, but the I agree that the community member that shared advice tonight um, was was great direction, and absolutely we'll take that to heart and build that into our process for great. the RFP distribution. Thank you. Okay, I don't think an amendment is necessary. Any other lights? Your lights off, Commissioner Menz. Thank you. Um, I, I'm pleased that we're moving forward with this. Um, I, I just want to remind people that there are some very exciting dialogues that are happening um, around the Friends of the Falls um, with the, I believe it's 47 um, uh, tribes. And uh, you know how we can possibly align ourselves with that I think would be wonderful. Um, I also would like us to explore beyond um, the indigenous community. Um, we all know that uh, there are others who have, have been harmed and I would like us to at least be open to conversations in that regard. So unless there is further discussion, um, all those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose, abstentions. That motion carries as well. And so, whew. Finally, we are then to um, our annual Lopet um, Foundation update. And I believe they flare, hopefully, yay, she's still here. All right. Um, so. <laughs> she's going to start jogging. Right. <laughs> Where, where's the uh, cross country skis, though, or whatever? Um, so, um, yes, Deputy uh, Superintendent Ringle. Yep. Sorry, one second. Tee it up. Uh, President Forney, Commissioners, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Claire Wilson here today, Executive Director of the Lopet Foundation. Uh, this marks the second time she has presented to the board, but the first time she would have presented to the board in this composition. She's here tonight primarily to provide um, uh, an overview of their annual report. This is required by our operating agreement with them. want to give kudos to, he's not there. But he was there. <laughs> um, Michael Schroeder, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, he is actually one of the authors of all of our agreements with the Lopet Foundation. And we have a lease, we have an operating agreement, we still have a portion of the donation agreement in, in play. And prior to that, we also had a transition agreement. And he made sure all of those things held together. My role is to be the agreement rep. And we have a team of staff across the organization, planning, asset management, events, um, park police, everybody who gets involved with that agreement. And at this point, we used to meet monthly, now we're down to quarterly. Uh, and then we also meet regularly with Lopet staff. So there's quite a bit that goes into keeping this relationship healthy. And at this time, um, the Lopet is in complete compliance with everything that we need. So with that, Welcome, Claire. Yay. <laughs> now I'm being harassed by certain members of the audience to be real quick, so um, <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, as Jennifer said, we're in compliance, so questions or no. <laughs> Um, I will be quick. So my name is Claire Wilson. Again, I'm the executive director at the Lopet Lopet Foundation. You can pronounce it however you like. Um, and I think I've actually like like. Um, like W. S Superintendent Ringgold said, like most of you all, I am new to my seat as well. I've been the executive director for a year and some change. And so last time I reported to the board, I was actually reporting on a fiscal year for which I was not responsible. This year I'm reporting on a fiscal year for which I am almost entirely responsible. So I'm here to take any of the blame for any parts which are not operating well and to give all of the kudos to my staff who have weathered COVID, a huge leadership transition, and have continued to work remarkably well with your staff. And I just 
cannot echo um, the comments enough about how much cooperation there is between the staff, how grateful we are to your staff who we are working with, with the exception maybe of Shane. Um, but others are wonderful, um, really genuinely great. And, um, and, uh, and of course, none of this would be happening without W.D. Superintendent Ringgold, and she has been a wise and caring guide of the agreement and has been super patient with me, and she's just one of my favorite humans. So that said, um, this is, uh, as she said, our report to you all, um, and we are, so just to ground us just really quickly, we are talking about physical year 20 to 21. So when I mentioned the winter activities, they are not this past winter, they are the previous winter. So bring ourselves back into the depths of the pandemic. And that is what we are um, talking about today. Um, and so again, the agreement and what I'm reporting on today is the part of the Lopet Foundation that is specifically in charge of the trailhead and certain parts of operating Theodore Worth. And so I'm reporting tonight on some of those, those trailhead specific activities and programs. So things that the Lopet could not do were there not a trailhead such as, you know, collect the revenue from ski passes or sell ski passes or conduct ski school or run the tubing hill, et cetera. So um, in the winter of 2020-21, just like all of you, we saw across the park system just an incredible increase in utilization. So we saw a 32% increase in annual ski passes. So that's not daily ski passes. That's people buying a pass for the entirety of the season. Um, and we served in the summer over 3,000 youth through our programs, clinics, camps, et cetera. So we were at capacity for the majority of the seasons. And we continue to operate. The staff were in, I was in, throughout all of COVID, we were in full operating mode. Um, because there was a demand, you know, that we provide solace and refuge and we, we met that demand. Of course, the trailhead itself was closed to the public for the, for the entirety of the winter. So if you drove by the trailhead, you would see a huge line. And that was a line just waiting for the rentals, waiting to buy ski passes. So we would let a few folks in at a time. And this was the first year that the Lopet fully operated the adventure shop inside of the trailhead. So we provided all the rentals. We did all of the merchandise, et cetera. And that was wonderful because it allowed us, whereas previously that had been vendors, um, it allowed us to control the customer service experience. So those customer service folks were our kids. They were youth who've been with us through, you know, sixth grade. And they feel such ownership over the space and they do an incredible job. And, um, and I mean, in last, that winter, they rented over 3,100 pairs of skis and sold over 4,000 daily passes. And so that was pretty impressive. And that does not count folks who came to the park to snowshoe and tube and snowboard. I mean, they were managing a lot of traffic and they were doing a great job. Um, this was the first year of our agreement that Mill Valley, so the food vendor in the trailhead, um, was fully operational. They had to do a lot of pivoting because building was closed, uh, but they did window service, there was outdoor Friday night music, and they actually had a very strong winter um, despite the closure. One thing that was down, and you'll see this in the metrics that I report on, was of course the schools were closed, and so we couldn't have school trips, we couldn't have you know field trips to the trailhead, which is typically where we touch a lot of the kids and kind of give them some of the exposure to Theo. So that wasn't happening. Um, but we were able to provide some space for schools um, in the spring who needed a place to be to be safe and have some kids come in who weren't doing very well in the digital environment. So that was a treat. We hosted some classes in the trailhead and they got to use Theo as their learning playground, which was great. Um, we do a survey every year that's included in the report. You all have that 89% of users rated their experience as excellent with our winter services. Um, we are responsible for some infrastructure improvements in the park, and um, you know, part of that is that now the trailhead is fully operational, um, and that we provide quality grooming across the system. So, as you all are, know, we we groom Columbia, Hiawatha, the Chain of Lakes, so Bidet, Madaska, Isles, Cedar, and Brownie, and then we also obviously groom Worth. Uh, in the winter of 20, we started grooming an additional path on the lakes for multi-use, and that was hugely popular and very well received, and it is no small feat because to, you know, just to cover that territory once is pretty extensive. So 
um, folks were very pleased with that. We've continued to make lighting improvements in the park. Um, we've made some improvements to the snowboarding hill. We've lengthened the tow rope. And in past fiscal year, we also began planning for, and this fiscal year executed, more improvements to the snowboarding hill and also um, began to tackle the challenge of increased instructional area to accommodate more beginners. So um, that was started, the planning started in 20 to sustain that outburst of growth and we met it this year. Um, the ongoing challenges, of course, along with you all, we are working on creating an inclusive environment in the trailhead and assuring um, that we are responsible for that. Signage and wayfinding is a big part of feeling welcomed and grounded, and there's still a lot of improvement that needs to happen there. Um, beginner and instructional areas, like I said, and then parking. We're not going to talk about parking, and that just is a thing. Um, so. This is just a chart to show off the ski pass sales. <laughs> um, but when we took over in uh, you know, 2015, 2016 winter operations, this just shows the growth. So in 2021, we sold just under 10,000 annual passes. And I am pleased to report, and I'll just steal my thunder from next year, that you know, we budgeted this year to see a decrease in that. We just thought for sure we couldn't you know, continue that level that the, that the COVID momentum would not continue. And we did sell more ski passes this year. Not a lot more, but we sustained that growth. So I'm very, we should all be very proud of that. Folks are still pursuing outdoor activity at that level. Um, we do have, as Jennifer said, we have um, some metrics in our agreement to which we are responsible, and we did meet all of those metrics, and, and you can read through those. Um, there were some that weren't as robust as they have been in the past, again, because we just couldn't get as many kids to the trailhead. We couldn't transport them. They weren't in school. Um, I would like to say that I'm very excited that we continue to have a lot of use of the mountain bike trail, so I know the Part of the agreement is the operation of the mountain bike trails, and we have seen and continue to see an explosion in mountain biking, as you all know, but it's truly a diverse group of kids who are mountain biking, and, you know, we're never going to totally move the needle on skiing just because of the, you know, the type of sport that it is, but in mountain biking, we are really seeing the kids engaged and loving it. So we are this year planning, and in last fiscal year, started doing the financial planning for a very exciting skills park up on Stadium 18 and a new pump track and just working to continue to make that as exciting for kids as possible. And we also instituted lots of free days. So we just have free Saturday, free Sunday at the trailhead where folks could come enjoy any of the activities for free. And we are going to continue that. Um, this is a report. Oh, <laughs> this is poorly formatted on this slide. But um, this is just to report on the revenue and expenses related to trailhead activities. So again, this is not the LOPIT overall. This is the portion of the LOPIT that's directly responsible for the activities in the operating agreement. And as you can see, well, you can't see there, but um, in fiscal year 1920, we reported almost a $56,000 loss on those activities. And we are moving in the right direction. This year, we're at a 3,000 loss, and I feel fairly confident that next year I'll come to you with a positive balance. Um, so we are continuing to control expenses, trying to create new ways to operationalize and create some sustainable economic activity in through the building so that we can continue to sustain our operations and to sustain the trailhead. And so we are committed to that and we are seeing it move in the right direction and pretty significantly so. Um, so I just want to say that, oh, whoops, I'm a bad driver of this, Lord. Oh, that's not, the, well, it doesn't matter. I was going to talk a little bit about stuff outside of the agreement, but you all know, you can read on the website. We've got lots of things going on, trail kids, events, and we're just continuing to work to make sure that we are reaching as much of the community as possible. And so in that sense, I just wanted to talk about a few things that are, that we're seeing moving forward. And one is that we operate a space on Humboldt and Dowling on the north side, and we have entered into a partnership with the Youth Farm and a partnership with Camden Cycles, and that building is starting to be actively programmed. And we are, re in partnership with uh, Youth Farm, are constructing a greenhouse on that property. It's one of the few pieces of land that's um, zoned for urban ag. And so we're gonna construct a greenhouse there, and Camden Cycles, which is a north side 
bike shop is currently operating out of the storefront there. So we're just continuing to support activity in the neighborhood as best we can. And uh, we are continuing to work to strengthen um, the, the park board and LOPIT relationship, particularly on thinking about how to continue to dismantle racism in the outdoor space. And so we have been having some great visioning sessions and we're continuing to do that work with you all. We are planning to host a World Cup in 2024, so planning for that is now underway. And then um, there's just a lot of attention to infrastructure. We just, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to assure that we can continue to operate the park at the level of excellence to which we feel we are responsible. So we are going to be doing a lot of fundraising and grant writing and thinking about how to continue to make the right level of infrastructure improvements to the park. And finally, I just wanted to make sure that you all had in front of you what our DEI work is and the way in which we're headed as an organization and a culture. So um, we are moving in alignment with the Parks for All plan and assuring that we are doing everything that we can as an organization to confront and dismantle racism both internally and externally as we work to bring about a shared passion for the outdoors across Minneapolis. So the staff are instituting a program called Recovery from White Conditioning that's mandated for all of our white staff. We have instituted uh, several strategic equity goals and we are continually holding ourselves accountable to those goals. And part of bringing them in front of you today is that you know we do believe that we have to have our community partners hold us accountable to that as well. And since you are our primary community partners, I wanted you to have this in front of you and to hold us accountable um, as we hold ourselves accountable to continuing to evolve into an anti-racist organization. Was that fast enough, Shane? I try to talk fast, man. <laughs> awesome. Uh, any no, questions? You, you could do a road show with this. I, wonderful. Anyway, um, Commissioner um, Usage. <laughs> Thank you, President Forney. Uh, the activities, winter activities that the LOPED assists us with are not exclusive to uh, Theater Worth Park. Could you touch upon the other locations as well? Absolutely, President Forney, Commissioner Music. So we, um, we grow, as I said, Columbia, Hiawatha, and the Chain of Lakes. And then we have activities outside of the agreement. So we have programs in some of the Three Rivers parks. But all of the activities that we are responsible for in terms of our agreement with you all occur at Columbia, Hiawatha, and then the Chain of Lakes. Okay. And the grooming that happens uh, outside of Theater Worth, is that all done by volunteers? President Forney, community message. Yes, it is primarily done by volunteers. We also have some paid staff who do it as well. But there are a devoted group of volunteers who also do some of the grooming. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if I got this correct, but uh, um, Commissioner Menz. Thanks. Hey, Claire. Um, I do have a suggestion. So one of my constituents asked about gross golf course and if we could get that groomed. And I'm hearing that there's volunteers, so maybe it's a good, and they've made a good point that it's a, a flattest course, so mm -hmm. it's, it's really accessible for people of the older generation and don't want a lot of hills. And then second of all, I, I just think that this is a really good example of where our community partners can actually push us to. So the work that you're doing and how you're working with engaging youth is really, in, incredible. I mean, I, I've seen it firsthand with my son being on the Northeast ski team and the diversity and how many, uh, you're changing the narrative around how outdoor athletics is done. And I think it's a really good lesson for us as we look into the future of like, sometimes we can't always do it as well as others. And we need to create win-win situations for kids. And the Lopet Foundation has been a huge win-win for kids and for the park board. Thank you, Commissioner Elper. Yeah, thanks. First, I, I'd just like to set the, the record straight with you all that I didn't ask Claire to put parking, parking, parking down <laughs> on, on her slide. <laughs> um, but uh, I did have a, just a couple of questions, one of them related to that. But, um, you know, I've gotten, thank you, I really appreciate the, um, sharing all all the work that you've done, not this past winter, but the winter before. It's very exciting to to see all the things you've accomplished, um, you and your staff. Um, so I have gotten some questions, and I don't 
know how to respond um, to constituents of mine who sometimes compare um, uh, Minneapolis to St. Paul and they say, why does it cost money to go skiing in Minneapolis when it's free in St. Paul? And I just, I want to, um, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's very complex and I, I, but you know, people specifically in South Minneapolis who say, hey, I could pay to go to Hiawatha Golf Course to ski, but I, I, it's free if I go to Highland um, in St. Paul. So I don't know, I just, it's something, a question I haven't been able to respond and I feel like sufficiently to them, other than to say, well, we have higher quality here. Um, but if you have anything you could add to that, that would be great, maybe later, if not tonight. I mean, I can't, Commissioner Alper, thanks for the question. And I actually, I don't, so there, are, every system has a different fee, right? A different pay to play, essentially. And I get this question a lot. And, you know, I'm thinking deeply about our fee structure around ski passes. I mean, it is, it is an incredible investment of time, energy, and money to maintain ski trails. And like Commissioner Men said, I would love to say, yes, we'll do Gross Point right now. I would love to, see, I'd love to groom every park in the city. Um, it is very expensive. And so I am very open to thinking about how we start, and we as a staff are having a discussion about how we're able to sustain operations and potentially have some kind of sliding scale or some different way of collecting the pass um, revenue. There's also a lot of folks in Minneapolis who can afford to, to purchase a pass. And you know, my hope is that we haven't even tapped most of the folks who, lots of folks either don't realize that a pass is required, especially on the chain of lakes. And I certainly have no interest in policing that, but I do have interest in spreading the word that if you love the little bit and you love what we do, buying a pass helps that. And it supports, you know, the youth who are using the trails and, you know, and genuinely to have the experience of walking out your door and skiing around the cities, that's pretty special. Absolutely, I, I agree, thanks for that. Um, I just have a couple other questions, President Farney. Um, I guess I'm curious, what, what's the outlook for natural snow in the future? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you have some thoughts on that, I'm interested. Well, Commissioner Alper, the outlook is not awesome. I mean, we're going to have less and less natural snow. And the catch-22 is that it's also not awesome to make snow. I mean, it's not the most environmentally friendly process right now. And we've started, I mean, and that's an understatement, but we have started a committee to look at are there other ways to sustainably make snow? Are there other ways we can be looking at to do it? But I do believe, I mean, I've heard everything from five to ten years will be completely dependent on on artificial snow trails for winter recreation. And so then we just have to think about where our priorities are. I mean, is that, I mean, I, whoever in the ski community is listening will, you know, end their membership with a little bit right now. But I mean, I think we have to think transformationally about how we want to confront the climate crisis and what our role in that is. And so I don't, I, I'm yeah. also not a yeah. scientist. Are the scientists still here? Where did they go? <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> they, they left after at 7.45, um, three hours in. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks for that, I appreciate that. I think I think it's something that we all should be thinking about in future, you know, what, what, we, what we do as we look towards, you know, um, climate resiliency in the future. I don't have an answer, I just, it's a discussion I wanna start. And then last, but certainly, certainly not least about the about the parking, um, I I know I know I had written in my notes. I know that parking at the trailhead is an issue, mm -hmm. and um, lots and lots of use at peak times. And we there's only one bus that comes every 30 minutes. And I guess I am wondering what sorts of transportation demand management strategies we at the park board can do in partnership with the Lopet Foundation to support. Um, to, su to support recreation at this site and how how these strategies can be incorporated into uh, I can't read my notes into the into the MOU you know really to help expand capacity for skiing for tubing for other outdoor activities to not have the number of parking spaces limit the number of people who can visit the park so just I want to start that conversation. If you have any thoughts, 
Go Thank for you it. for that. And we are in constant conversation about that. We have we have thoughts about how to continue to tackle that challenge. And of course, um, along with the park board, you know, we all have responsibility for how to manage parking in that space and for how to encourage different modes of transit. And it's super frustrating if you're a family and you're coming to tube and like you've come all that way and then you can't find a place to park and then you can't get a tube and that you know, I mean, it's it's a it's certainly a challenge that's a high priority for all of us. Uh, can I follow up, President Forty? Is that something that we could address in a future uh, MOU, Secretary Ringgold, or Deputy Superintendent? I don't know what what hat you're wearing right now. <laughs> um, President Forney, Commissioner Elper, I don't know that we'd have to put it into an MOU. It's something that we're very committed to. There might be some master plan changes. There's probably mm -hmm. some additional work the board. I think we've already had some initial conversations on it in terms of how we might administer fees in that area for parking as well. So this is, um, we will hopefully have our par a new parking analyst on very shortly. And one of the topics will start, see where their skill sets are around this and then contemplate whether we need to bring in some additional consulting services. But it, I don't think it's something that has to be in the MOU. Um, there might be some modifications in terms of dedicated lots so there might be an amendment, but it's a need that we both have. Great, thank you so much. The, no further questions. Okay, I think Commissioner Thompson, or, okay, go for it. Thank you, President Forney. Um, I, I just wanna make a note, because I was checking the Enterprise Fund, that parking and golf and ski are all pretty big top money makers for us. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for partnering with Amanda Dobbs and Camden Cycles on behalf of District 2 and Ward 4 and Weber Camden area. We are always desperate for amenities. And when I, I meant to reach out to you, when I found that out earlier this week, I was like, wait, that looks like that Loppet building. And it's Loppet, everybody, it's Loppet. Um, so I, I drive past it very often. I drove past it to get here tonight. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just thank you for that. Uh, I very much love the partnership, and um, I watched that precipitous growth. It is, yes, parking is an issue, but that it's great. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Commissioner Schaefer? Quick question. Do you have any breakdown for either daily passes or annual passes, Minneapolis versus regional? I'd just be kind of curious on that number. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer, yes, we can provide that. We haven't always, I believe starting last year, we did through the new okay. registration system. So I can provide some geographic data on the passes. And it's just a curiosity and no reasoning for that, but that would be great. And then I just want to tell you, thank you. I really think the way that you have cultivated a strong, committed volunteer group is really part of your success. And as we as commissioners start to think about our strategic directions around unifying our volunteer support system within the parks, um, whether it's indirect, organic, or direct, there's probably a combination of things that you have done with that. Um, if you would be willing, uh, I mean, I, we would love to, or at least I personally would love to use you as a resource for um, how you have any intentional ways you have cultivated that. But there is a real sense of community. Like if you're a lop, you know, Loppet, what did you like? <laughs> Whoever, you know, if you're a Loppet volunteer, I mean, you have got to be there. I mean, these are the days and, you know, God forbid you're ill or whatever, you know what I mean? So I think that um, that's, that comes from the sense of community that people have felt around that organization. Well, thank you for saying that. Of course, we'd be happy. I mean, there is a long legacy of volunteer. You know, that is not at all contributed um, to the current little bit. But I would say that we are currently very committed, and Camden Cycles is an example of this, of spreading those community roots is, and strengthening them as much as possible. I mean, community is the heart of who and what we are. And co-creating programming with community and volunteer opportunities, we would love to talk about that. And intentionally diversifying our volunteer base. Not seeing any other lights. Seriously, you could take this on the, uh, you got, you got it down. You're doing a marvelous job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. First of all, I love it. The fact that it's Theo. 
<laughs> <laughs> That's marvelous. Um, I'm sure that Ted is <laughs> pleased with the name, whatever. So, um, so this is from, oh, whatever, a year ago and everything. Do you have a sense of, have you grown again? Uh, do you feel that there's that capacity for a lot more growth? Um, the ski passes, uh, the restaurant, I mean, they're both fabulous. Do you have a sense? President Fournay, I do. I mean, so this year we're really considering this past, like the year that we're in right now, the baseline year for the trailhead. Um, and we, because it's the first year now that we're truly open and operational, we're open all winter. And um, we are we are doing quite well. I mean, we had, like I said, we had budgeted for a decrease, assuming that there would be at least a utilization decrease after the COVID bump, but there was not one. And so we are feeling like we are in a pretty strong position right now to continue to grow, and we're just being very thoughtful and intentional about what and how that looks. Um, but I want to get this place operating you know, in the red before we make any major decisions. We have to stabilize, and as you can see in the financials, there's still some building debt that we want to, you know, go ahead and be responsible for and then be intentional about where to grow next. But there's a lot of potential. Yahoo, fantastic. And the unfortunate thing, I'm not sure to address uh, Commissioner Alpers, is that we were going to have two stops. Um, on LRT and everything going right through. And uh, it's uh, our railway that uh, just kind of doesn't want that type of expansion and everything. And then I have a horrible thing I have to ask you, but I hear it's gotten a nickname, but the bristles from the grooming. Have we found a way to not lose bristles? <coughs> So, President Fournay, I, I don't know if Deputy <laughs> Superintendent wants to weigh in here. The bristles, I'm actually not, I, the bristles, I believe, come from the equipment that, that grooms the ice, which are for the ice skating rink. There's, there's no equipment that the LOPIT utilizes that leaves a bristle residue. Okay. I, 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 like I say, I, <laughs> I've checked under the <laughs> thing of a bob that does the grooming. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been a concern by people and um, whatever, the uh, Earth Day cleanup people on aisles always complain to me. So I just, you know, need to, to ask the question. And it looks like we've got maybe an answer over here. Deputy Superintendent Ringel. Thank you, President Forney. Commissioner Musich, did you have? I was just going to, I was trying to tell you not to turn your light off because I've also gotten this question oh, okay. and I know you know the answer, so. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, com uh, President Forney, Commissioner Musich. So it does have a name, Bristlegate. <laughs> um, and I think actually Assistant Superintendent Barrick knows quite a bit about it as well. But it does come off of the... Um, sweeping equipment that we use for our ice rinks. So the reason why I think you find it specifically at Lake of the Isles is, of course, because we have an ice rink there. Now, I know Assistant Superintendent Barrick with his staff have worked very hard to develop um, better methodologies and looked at different types of bristles um, and different compositions that provide less bristle runoff. I don't know what other word <laughs> we would residue um, removals drops, but uh, it is not the lopet. So okay. um, <laughs> I'll take the blame for all the other stuff, but the bristles not on me. So sorry, I had to bring it up. Player doesn't get that one. Okay, all right. Thank you so much and everything for answering all these questions very much. Unless there's any. I don't see any more lights and everything. Thank you very much for be being here so late. Um, you made it before 8 o'clock. Wow. Anyway, so we do have another presentation, I believe, right? The 20-year uh, neighborhood park plan. I know we had some tangibles, but they got taken away from us all. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Director Wiseman yeah. and uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder. All right, good evening, President Forney and uh, commissioners. And I'm here to begin the presentation of the NPP 20, uh, 2021 annual report. 
And yes, you did have hard copies, which I uh, collected back um, because we found an error on one of the charts. So uh, you do have the electronic copy that's attached to the agenda, and I will be sending out a corrected copy, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow, that has the correction to that chart. So I apologize for that. So our NPP 20 annual report, this is the fifth report, and uh, I am excited to talk about uh, the accomplishments that we have made over the first five years of uh, the 20-year neighborhood park plan. So of course, this is an, a historic agreement that was made between the city of Minneapolis and the Park and Recreation Board. It provides over $11 million a year for the next 20 years that will be used for park maintenance, rehab, and capital improvements. And of course, we passed our criteria-based uh, system for allocating the capital and rehab uh, park projects through our capital um, improvement program. So by the ordinance, we are required to report out to the board and to the city council on the annual report. Um, this report covers the years 2020 and then uh, shows what is planned for 2022. We are also required to report our outcomes on operating costs. NPP 20 is expected to improve efficiencies and costs. It increases maintenance, which will maximize the service life of park assets over time. We're reducing backlog results uh, for larger number of park assets that are consistently available to the public. And then some costs will result, uh, cost savings will result from investment in energy efficient materials uh, as the rehabilitations are happen happening in our park buildings. So tracking five years of accomplishments in the first five years of NPP 20, we have completed 15, 15 capital investment projects. We have three investment projects that are planned to be completed in 2022. We have 12 capital investment pro projects that are in process. We have completed 11 new or renovated play areas five new or renovated aquatic facilities, including pools, splash pads, and water park improvements. In our rehabilitation investments, we have made 13 recreation centers completed with major repairs and updates, 56 parks where park play equipment has been repaired or replaced, 46 new renovated athletic fields, tennis courts, and basketball courts, 66 parks with concrete path repairs and replacements, and nine uh, completed roof replacements. So next we'll get into our operating area. So we, uh, we, the original amount was $3 million of property tax money that uh, was used to increase our maintenance and repair practices. And that has grown through our property tax levy increase in 2020 and 2021. It was $3.5 million each year and we fully expended those amounts. For 2022, that amount is $3.7 million. And if you remember back in our budget retreat, this paid for, um, and then part of the capital paid for increasing our full-time workforce by about 45 em employees uh, throughout our system. So for maintenance practices, we've anal we analyze, evaluate, train, and then evaluate the outcome and fully initi um, initiate, initiated new processes and procedures. So for our measurements, we have our 2021 service level and our target service level. And for each service level, 
we are meeting or exceeding what our target best practice service level is. Everything except for plumbing and uh, startups and shutdowns as the pandemic has really impacted um, that area uh, rather than some of the other areas. So then the other good news is that in our ordinance, our guaranteed minimum amount was $10.5 million, and there is to be an adjustment, an agreed upon adjustment uh, that is approved by both the city council and uh, the board of commissioners. And through negotiations last year and through the 2022 budget process, we were able to adjust our five-year amount based on uh, inflationary factors. And you will see that our guaranteed minimum amount for 2022 to 2026, it's $11.5 million in 2022. And it, um, increases to $13.1 million in 2026. What's important about this is as, as um, capital construction inflation occurs, in order for us to maintain the, 20, uh, the MPP 20 program and get through all the parks at least once, it's important that we make these adjustments. Uh, so you'll see those amounts reflected in our CIPs going forward. So our six-year capital improvement program, uh, you'll see that we break the dollar amount out between the rehab and the capital investment. And you'll see that our capital investment is now um, able to grow from um, just under $9 million up to $9.3 million. Rehab is remaining more consistent because of course, as we are making the major renovations, uh, the rehab money uh, will get to more of a level amount um, going forward where previous years we were catching up on a lot of the rehab. I'm gonna now turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Thank you, Julie. So I'll rock, walk through the rehabilitation and um, a capital programs in a little more detail. Um, the, and these goals were important as we set them out in the original uh, MPP 20 program that the rehabilitation projects would be oriented to enhancing park safety, um, meeting critical codes even as they change over time, and importantly, um, implementing our significant ADA transition plan. And relative to that, you'll see as we go through some of the, some of the charts, that in the rehabilitation program, we, we initially directed $800,000 a year for the first five years towards ADA improvements. And we've, we're finding that as we look at the cost of like uh, retrofitting buildings and particularly restrooms, that that's not enough. So we're really looking with rehab to um, find those things that are most significant need of repair and get those addressed um, until such time, so that they can hold themselves over until we get to the point of being able to affect a capital in investment of the project. Um, Julie talked about the process for uh, maintenance. We also have a process for identifying projects under the rehab where we're, we have now an inventory of, of nearly all the major park assets, assessing their conditions annually, and then finding a way to prioritize the need uh, based on their condition and other factors uh, that become important in, in setting themselves up for uh, the rehabilitation program. So as of the end of 2021, this is the chart from the 2020 projects across the nine rehabilitation categories. They're listed on the left. Um, and and uh, you, you can see where we have been spending dollars and you can see that in this, in this particular year, uh, we have spent nearly 90% of, of the, or at least 90% of the dollars that have been allocated. Um, some of these uh, dollars have carried over with projects, um, particularly as we look at expensive things like roofs and the HVAC systems. Uh, that are in buildings. And then you can see the number of projects completed um, as you move to the right end of this chart. This is the same chart for 2021. So it takes us a little longer to plan and implement. So you can see that we're not nearly so far along in this one as we look at uh, only 78% of the projects instead of 98% of the projects completed, but still a significant amount of, of, of work being accomplished across all the categories. HVAC is lesser because we overspent in the previous year and we're setting ourselves up for 2022 
uh, work where we start to get that number back to a normal amount. So this, these, these numbers are zero in this chart because uh, as it says in the right hand, right, right column, these are numbers as of the, 12, the 31st of December of last year. So we hadn't actually started anything, but it begins to demonstrate um, the dollars uh, that we're directing toward the rehabilitation categories, um, each of the nine rehabilitation categories. Um, I, I will say it's important for us as we move through this that we work that the planning and asset management work really closely together to find the amounts that we expect to need in each one of these categories. So instead of having each one of these be the same for every single year, uh, we meet and we try to adjust based on what we're finding in the assessments and priorities so that we can uh, best accommodate the, um, the, the work in as many categories as possible. Um, NPP 20 Capital, you're probably more familiar. These are the, the projects that come before you where you're asked to uh, approve concept plans based on master plans. These are the ones that are based on the equity metrics that uh, Adam and, and the data team look at each year. And we are allocating funding based on the equity rankings on a rolling basis. So there are new parks coming through uh, every year. Um, these are the 2020 capital Im improvements and you can see the parks listed, the dollar amounts, and, um, and, and it's important to look at this again from the perspective of how we move through a planning project. The year the dollars first become available, we're moving through, through community engagement um, and, and some of the design. And usually we don't get into implementation until well into the second year. Um, so you'll see that we, in this case, we're 41% um, of the projects have been, uh, the, of the budget's been allocated and moved into. You can see the schedule for completing the projects. Um, some of them are waiting until even this year from 2020 uh, to be implemented. If we were to look at this chart from 2019, you would see that number at the bottom, that, that percentage being uh, very close to 100%. Uh, uh, the list from 2020 laid out similarly, um, where we list the, the, uh, the, the, the park projects and the allocations in each one. And because we, are, we were in 2021 moving through the engagement, it's actually in 2022 when we start to move some of those projects ahead uh, toward, um, toward implementation. And then of course, as, if we look at the, the dollars, the seven and a half million dollars have been allocated in 2022, according to the capital improvement plan, we are really just getting started with the, with the um, community engagement on, on these projects. One more holdover with Jordan Park. And I think Julie and I will stand for questions. Maybe. Thanks. I really appreciate this report, and um, it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot of work that has gone into all of these these projects. And I guess I uh, believe, but would like to confirm. That has the number of planning staff decreased over the last few years, like, like, or has it stayed static, or has it gone up? President Forney, Commissioner Alper, I would be glad to answer that question. The number of planning staff has decreased in the last couple of years. There was an increase when MPP 20 first passed, recognizing that we'd have a whole lot more projects to be implementing with the dollars that have become available. But over the last couple of years, we have lost. Uh, I think three or four staff, including staff from design and project management, which are instrumental in advancing these projects. And are you, uh, um, so has the workload increased per person then, or like with the amount of money that we're dealing with? Would President you? Forney and Commissioner Alper, um, y yes. I mean, we're, we're, we're very busy in planning and, and um, probably each one of you have heard me say this as you bring projects to us and say, can't we do this? I'll always say, we'd be very interested in doing that, but we have, uh, uh, this is our obligation. We need to deliver this. Um, and we've been making really good progress on this. I believe we're, if you look at the, the, the ranking of parks that go from, that count all of our neighborhood parks, I think we're something like through number, park number 56. And if we're able to continue at the pace that, that we've been on. COVID changed that pace a little bit uh, because we couldn't do the depth of, of, of community engagement that we would have wanted to during COVID. We did a, a little bit of shift uh, to take on a little more rehab during that year. But if we're able to continue at this pace, um, Adam will have a more exact number, but we will finish the MPP 20 cycle, 
the first time through and still be able to get probably to, uh, to some, of the, some of the parks more than one time, probably in years 18, 19, and 20. But yes, we are busy and we, we are fully obligated and I'm sure we'll be talking through the year about uh, trying to find ways to keep up better with this. Great, thank you. Thank you, President Forney. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Deputy Superintendent Schroeder, for being here. I have, uh, did I saying that right? Assistant. assistant. I'll, just be, I'll just be assistant Frick. for now. If that's <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I have to sit up there. Okay, it's, uh, we'll take a pause for Thompson here. Um, I, would, I am curious about some of the language in this because I'm going to guess I'm not the only commissioner who gets emails about things like the Harriet Banshell or resurfacing bike paths or, you know, cracks somewhere, something. Why hasn't this backstop been replaced? Um, when, we, when we do things like address critical failures, and improve or restore functionality, th those are kind of vague. Um, how do we make that litmus to include that criteria? Because I, I do see a lot of, of these funds going to capital projects. We, I mean, we've spent the lion's share of our conversations since we've been, since I've been uh, on this board, um, a lot around a lot of those things out of planning. Are, are there things like, like the band shell, or do we find like when it talks about critical, you know, oh my gosh, this thing is totally broke down, like let's get on this. How do, how do we address those things in regard so, to this? Uh, President Forty, Commissioner Thompson, one thing I need to make clear from the beginning is MPP 20 only addresses uh, facilities in neighborhood parks. So when you talk about the van shell, that's in a regional park and that's a different source of funding. Um, many of the paths that you would talk about are part of the regional system and not part of the neighborhood park system. Um, the, we, we struggled at the beginning to try and identify what the right split is between capital and rehab, knowing that we originally had these additional $8 million and $11 million, $10.5 million total originally, what would be the approximate correct split? And we have hovered around the one-third, two-thirds ratio of rehabilitation to capital, um, knowing that what we have is, is a, a limited capacity. We have, we have extraordinary capacity, but limited amount of time in our own staff to be doing rehabilitation projects. Um, and uh, uh, Director Evenson and his staff have been doing an amazing job, particularly in the last couple, in the last, uh, couple of years, identifying and programming improvements. And um, I wish they were, they were here or could share some of the progress they've made in identifying and scheduling things like courts, which has been a, a constant a problem for us is keeping up with them, but but I think they're making significant progress in terms of resurfacing courts, which is um, one of the things that we find happening oftentimes in neighborhood parks um, being being neglected. So we are we, we, we continue to, to look at the, the split of, of between those and direct as much attention as we can get into um, what those um, what the critical failures are. Initially, critical failures were things like. Um, I think it might have been at, uh, well, it was a recreation center that actually had a failing roof because we had a cracked um, cracked uh, beam in a ceiling. Mm. That was critical. We had a, a facility that was in danger of collapsing. We had uh, roof systems that um, that were leaking or were, were uh, and when we look at the expansiveness of that, actually looking at the whole envelope of buildings. Um, so when we look at those things relative to like a backstop that was failing, the backstop was actually clearly a lower priority because we had buildings that were had roofs that probably couldn't survive. So, so may I ask a follow-up? So, am, am I on? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, so, okay, recognizing this is neighborhood parks and there's a resurfaced tennis court that has, I've lived in my house for 12 years and it has never been redone. I walked out on there today. Um, it was pretty bad and nobody plays tennis on it. So, so things of that nature. <clears throat> Is is it is it incumbent on us to split it, or or could there be a year where we just strictly go and we we go out to all these neighborhood parks, we figure out paint jobs that need to be done, we fix the light bulbs, um, we we resurface the tennis courts, and we say for this year we're just sidelining capital whatever, and we're only doing this, and we're gonna all hands on deck 
figure out as many things that we can fix in a, a summer or something like that. Um, is that possible or are we, are we supposed to split it in some way? The uh, President Forney and um, Pr Commissioner Thompson, we are supposed to split it. The original program was set up to address maintenance, rehabilitation, and capital improvements. We had definitions for each one of those. And certainly, we, as, as I noted, we have shifted the amounts we put into the various categories each year, and we could shift the amount that we split between rehabilitation and capital projects. One of the things that's important is that we're looking carefully at the approved master plans to make certain that we're not going in and repairing or rehabilitating a court in a park that might have that court removed and placed in a different location within the park. So there's a lot of coordination between what exists today in its condition and how, the, kind of the sequence before that, that uh, asset might be changed in a master plan. One, one last question out of curiosity since you mentioned it. Um, which, which came first, MPP $20 or some of these master plans? Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Thompson, um, I got here in 2015 and, and both were underway, but I, I think the master plans I don't, I don't want to say for certain because there, there was uh, under uh, Superintendent Miller a, a coordinated effort to drive both forward. And um, in, in the time when my predecessor, Bruce Chamberlain, was in this role, um, they had been uh, moving forward with uh, service area master plans already. Um, when I came here in 2015, it was the summer of engagement, as we called it, um, preceding the, the, the determination of the, the MPP 20 program. So they, they were largely uh, parallel, and necessarily so. We wouldn't have known what we would be asking for if we couldn't be assessing the parks and their conditions and also looking forward to what the parks might have to be to serve a, community, a change in community. So one last point of curiosity. I guess I have one more, one more. I have 30 seconds. Um, this is more philosophical for everybody. Per this tennis court by my house, it's never used because it is unusable. But if it were resurfaced five years ago, two years ago, seven years ago, it would be. There is a master plan for the park that I'm thinking of right by my house, and it calls for the removal of that tennis court. But I'm curious, and I've had some engagement with neighbors that if it were resurfaced, it would be played on, but it's already been removed. So it's just a, just a point of thought. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, did you want to say anything? Nope. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that it's roughly one-third rehab, two-thirds capital. Um, and you said that that evolves, that number evolves. What are the factors that you take into account? Um, how that number shifts and, and you know, it's, it's a rough proportion, but how, how does that shift and what are the decisions that you make um, in putting, you know, because you say you have a two-year cycle on the CIP, right? So that means you're not getting to all the 2022 list this year, right? Some are going to cycle in the next year, two years, maybe three years. How do you how do you pick from that list, and what are your determining factors? President Forney, Commissioner Schaefer, the, the question of how did we determine a one-third, two-thirds split? Um, this was at the very beginning of the program. We didn't know. Um, we, we, looked, we, we, we looked at it and made a, an educated guess, mm -hmm. and we've been kind of following that educated guess since, and I think it's, it's largely borne out. Um, and what, what's important that when we look at rehabilitation, it's not always uh, projects that are undertaken by asset management. We do contract out some of those improvements. The planning division actually contracts out several mm -hmm. rehabilitation, like tennis courts. We've been doing that uh, as well. So, so it's it's not the, the 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 definition between what becomes a capital project in planning and a rehabilitation project in asset management isn't so clear. Um, but it is important that you'll find the, the two divisions and the two departments working very closely as we move through a budget period to make certain that we're approximating things correctly. It was really important early on that the uh, asset management division was um, assessing the condition of, of, uh, of uh, the assets across the system. And um, I believe with perhaps just a few exceptions, they're through that process. And so now we know what are the highest priority needs in the rehabilitation categories each year. 
what we don't do is is um, schedule those according to like the equity matrix. If something's failing, it's failing. It doesn't matter if it's in a wealthy neighborhood or poor neighborhood. We're gonna, if it's failing, we need to find a way to get to it. Um, and so what we, we do is we use that rehabilitation list and we pick the top priority list and work all the way through until we run out of money for that year. Sometimes we're actually finding ways that we could pull money forward from a, from a succeeding year um, to be able to go a little bit far, farther. Sometimes it's necessary for us, if you were to look at the um, the synthetic turf category, you'll see that we haven't spent anything, but we know we have a significant project, I think at Stewart Park. What we need to do is build up funds through the cycle before we have enough dollars to be able to address a full replacement of the, the turf at Stewart Park. Okay. <laughs> uh, President Forney and commissioners, I also just want to uh, say and remind uh, commissioners, or maybe this is the first time you've heard this, um, when we implemented MPP 20 and we determined how much we needed uh, based on all the assessments we did of all the neighborhood parks, we thought we needed approximately $15 million a year annually to do everything that was needed within, within the neighborhood park system. So we understand that there are needs in our neighborhood park system that we don't have the funding for, even though we got NPP 20. Yeah. I just had a, a kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, and this is just my you know learning curve. You've mentioned the three categories, capital, Ma rehab and maintenance, and I'm still, you know, the one third, two third is capital and, and rehab. Describe to me again the maintenance and then how, how that, what that dollar number is and how that fluctuates. Uh, President Forney and Commissioner Schaefer, uh, the maintenance part is actually maintenance and rehab. Um, and that is in our general fund budget and part of the $3 million property tax levy increase that we received. And so there's additional dollars built into our asset management budget and how they are addressing maybe Assistant <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent Barrick. Good evening. Good evening, commissioners. Um, so the MPP 20 funding for maintenance is primarily staff and some and materials. Um, and that materials is, is, includes a rehab kind of bu budget. Um, the way we're managing it um, with the new um, Chris DeRoche as a products project uh, manager and uh, Kelly, the analyst that we just hired, he ha they have been going through each uh, asset uh, to what you know, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder said, we're assessing each asset, coming up with an estimate. Some of that work that you're seeing is in the trail rehab work or the trail repair, um, that approach. Now that, that work was in the regional system, but that same approach where the trails were assessed, they were scored, we identified the highest areas, we put together a contract to a, the, the highest need areas, and we put together a contract to get that work done. Uh, the courts is probably a, the be a better example um, in that most of those courts are in neighborhood parks. But again, an assessment was done. Um, we identified which courts needed to be completely reconstructed, which ones could be seal coated or, or, or resurfaced. And then we, we go through it using the MPP 20 funding for rehab. And then some of this stuff, when it gets into trades like drinking fountains and stuff, we'll actually use our own in-house crews to do that repair or that maintenance. So it's it's an additional funding source. Um, you'll see in some of the strategic directions and the budget questions from last week, um, th there, we'll, have a, we'll have a spreadsheet for you next week that you can see some of this work coming out where they've actually identified kind of that gap of um, from MPP 20 to what it would truly take to get things into what we call the life cycle management. Um, so it's, it's also got, it's, this is a work in progress, right? And with uh, with Jeff, the director, uh, Director Evenson taking over asset asset management about two years ago, the addition of Chris, we're really starting to get our sea legs and build off of some of the work that was done before, but then get it into a shape where you're going to start to see results. And so, and this is just high level. So basically, maintenance and rehab are together. So you're one third. 
maintenance, rehab together, one third, but you're more the. Two thirds. Two thirds. Two thirds, maintenance, rehab, one third capital. Okay. Right? All right, I missed that from the beginning. I thought it had flipped. Okay. So, so when we look at the amounts that, that Julie was talking about that are increasing to $11.5 million this year, one third of that is for rehabilitation, two thirds is for capital, okay. and then there's additional allocation that goes towards towards maintenance. That's the three million. That's now three, three point seven million. That's in the general. Uh, you better say that one more time for everybody. Okay. <laughs> Capital and rehab. Start there. Yep. Um, we have eleven and a half million dollars, roughly split, one third rehab, two thirds capital, and beyond that there is maintenance. Just the core maintenance. It's the one that Julie um, highlighted as being. Uh, more frequent mowing, more frequent cleanings of buildings. That's an additional $3.7 million in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go ahead. The maintenance is, is property tax dollars. So that's in our general fund current service level budget. That is built in to that. And then the one-third, two-thirds split is shown on this chart, and this is our, our six-year CIP program. So this is the bonding amounts. So maintenance is completely general budget. Yes. So why do we call it NPP 20? I, no, I'm, I'm just asking that question. It, it was part of the ordinance. Yeah, if I could, there's an ordinance on this for commissioners want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, PV 16, um, and it, it, there were a couple of issues at the time. One was a capital need. One was an operational need. Um, and the operational need was just the trees weren't getting trimmed. The grass wasn't getting mowed. There were you see this later in the report. We just didn't have enough staff to do the basic stuff that you needed to do. And so the original ordinance increased the levy by $3 million in uh, 2016 that raised the base thing, your general fund. And so that's increased every year. That's why it's now 3.7 because you've had a multiplier effect on all the levies, so it's raised up. And so that's really just a catch up, but it was part of the ordinance that uh, passed as an operating fund uh, piece. The next piece then was the city had been providing, I believe it was $3 million annually in capital improvements that frequently would just be used for things like fixing the HVAC. I mean, just barely enough to do anything but just keep the lights on and the roofs from leaking. And that didn't even keep the roofs from leaking. Mm -hmm. and. The city then added another 8.5 million in, in capital of some sort in, in terms of, uh, there's two terms in the ordinance. Um, one is for um, capital projects and the other is for um, uh, rehabilitation projects. So there's a distinction there and sometimes you could say, are they, is there a distinction without a difference? So there's Capital projects was generally viewed as something new, and rehabilitation projects would be things that were to fix existing buildings to fix them back up. That was the 11.5 million. Um, that's um, well, or was it 10 point? It's on this chart, and that's what's been adjusted in 2022. That's now 11 and a half million in terms of those. And as far as deciding how to do it, I think Mr. Schroeder uh, described that. At the same time, there was a need for the, uh, the money. There was also a planning that was going on in terms of where you would do it. Conditions of buildings were ranked or properties or assessed on courts, on uh, neighborhood centers, on uh, trails or, or pathways, lighting fixtures in parks, a whole gamut of things that were analyzed uh, about how you'd spend the money. And then, I guess, based on all the needs, there was an allocation based on the staff on where, you'd, given the, ex, the the amount of money you had, where those dollars would flow to. I, ultimately, I think it's the board's decision about how to uh, allocate the money 
but I think it's fair to say that all the staff analysis that went in that demonstrated the need to the city council that, hey, you've got this huge system and it's being underinvested in a number of areas, you kind of add it up as uh, Director Wiseman said, we'd originally asked for 15 million and got less and so the need was 15 and so how did you how do you assess it so really i think you're right commissioner schaefer the the three million is in the npp ordinance but that's in your base budget now and it's added the 40 or so people i think that were mentioned where and does that increase i'm sorry to interrupt you okay. council rice does that increase like the rehab and capital investment is increasing from 2022 to 2026 yeah, no, that, that was a separate adjustment in the ordinance. After five years, we were allowed to adjust the base amounts that were in the ordinance. And their uh, superintendent, Bangora, I think, talked about it in this board or last year about how we oh. were able to negotiate a... The city didn't want to give us anything, and we got a pretty substantial increase, I think. Okay. So there, I know there's a lot here to unpack. Yeah. Um, Can you tell me the ordinance number one more time? Yeah, it's... Um, it's a it's a it's a um, what was the term a concurrent ordinance. The city has one, and I forget that number, but it's PB sixteen one to sixteen four. It's also an attachment in oh, yeah, the it's NPP in the report. twenty yeah. annual report. Okay, yeah. it's one of the yeah. attachments. You Thank can you. Look it up on the thing. I got a photo. I've got a copy here if you want it. Um, but so th yeah, that you'd have to a little bit. But the history is important about why it's there, and it's. A concurrent ordinance that we've got with the city so all the parameters that we're talking that's why there are these reports that every year you have to report and you have to project ahead six years and submit to the city and they have a right to review it because in, in essence it's a, you know a joint agreement between the city and the park board so maintaining fidelity to the purposes of the ordinance uh, are important um, but again, it's like you'll have all these assessments of all the needs of all the parks and where they are. There's an equity matrix that all of these things are looked through in terms of which parks are prioritized and stuff. We could probably spend a day on it. Yeah. And yeah, it's I don't getting wanna... close to the next day, and I tend to talk too much as the president reminds me frequently. <laughs> And I just have one more question, and I know I'm watching my time, but there's my questions have been short, but the answers have been long. Um, Maintenance, rehab, two-thirds, capital, one-third, right? Mm, nope. Well, okay, it's the other way then. Yep. Take, take maintenance out of it, and because that is, as, as Adam's pointing out, maintenance is not bonded. So if we okay, look at the okay. bonded amount, okay. which is the way the city's been doing it, right. one-third for rehabilitation, two-thirds for capital, or okay. about that. And then I think that's why a lot of the rehab projects tend to look like capital, right? I mean the nature of it. So then I think this is where the maintenance issue is kind of where people are squawking about it, I think, is because rehab, you know, is, could be just replacing the playground maybe, right? But it's a new playground, or would that be capital? Um, in, in most cases, they're capital projects, but I think you're describing it accurate. When, if we look at, uh, like, uh, redoing a bathroom in a building uh, that's under the ADA kind of rubric, we're also probably replacing front doors and making other significant improvements that make significant make the building look like it's been significantly improved. Right. But that is a rehabilitation project. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Menz. Thank you, President Forney. It, so basically, we do. It, it, if I'm doing the math right, that means we there is 15 million because the extra 3.5 or 3.7, right? Like if we look at 11.5 plus 3.7, that's 15.2. Um, originally, and I think the numbers, that, uh, I, I don't want to confuse things, but I think the original numbers were $2.5 million for capital levy, increased by $8 million. When we were looking, and that gives us, uh, get, gets us to $10.5 million in the first year of the program when we were looking for something for closer to 15. The maintenance was outside of that. The increase in maintenance was trying to get to those assets, as, as, as Council Rice was suggesting, pruning trees, mowing grass, cleaning buildings, doing those things more But frequently. we needed 15 million for capital and for rehab. Correct. And then the maintenance is outside. Correct. And is that our, and then the next question I have, which pertains to what Commissioner Thompson mentioned earlier, is these stagnant sort of 
entities or amenities that we have in our park that we know we're going to remove. So do we, and I'm assuming that we wait until we're going to replace it to remove it, but I'm wondering if that's, if it's possible to start maybe removing those things since we know it's not going to be there in the master plan and it's not being used to show that we're doing, I mean, I, we, I, there's a few in our district too. I mean, the Beltrami baseball field or the tennis court, like they sit there stagnant, even though we're not going to replace them. How would that, can we negotiate that in this? Do we have to wait until we're going to replace it? So President Forney, Commissioner Benz, I, I think uh, a suggestion that, that Council Rice made is, is maybe important to hear and that you have the ability to adjust the amounts every year. Um, but when let's just take the notion of a tennis court that is going to be replaced in a master plan sometime during the life of this 20-year program. The rehabilitation funds are intended to allow that facility to be perpetuated in its place until such time as the capital project takes, takes over and actually does the replacement. We, we're at a significant deficit and still trying to catch up on many of these things. And I think that's what um, Assistant Superintendent Barrick was characterizing uh, the work of the Asset Management Division, even just finding out the status and condition of all the facilities, the assets we have in our system has been a huge task. And we're finally catching up on that. The Director Evenson and his staff have done an amazing job of catching up and finally being able to better predict how much work we need to get to every year. But the intention of the rehab funds has, was always to allow the assets to exist, to remain in place and serviceable until we get to a capital project, knowing that every park in the system would be addressed by a capital project during the 20 year lifespan of the program. We're not there yet. We're still behind on rehabilitation projects. Um, but we're, but uh, I think the, the work that Director Evenson has been programming just in the last couple of years has been significant in helping us define the path to catching up. Finished? Okay, Commissioner Music. Thank you, President Forney. Um, I'm glad that question just got asked. Thank you, Commissioner Menz. It's something that I always used to ask as well, um, and I think it's an important thing to understand that if we, if we were to start spending money on removing things instead of rehab, we would not ever get to a place where the rehab stuff was happening. Um, and that, that's very troublesome to a lot of people. Um, another thing that I think it's very important for us to just remember is this only addressed our neighborhood parks. We don't have a strategy that's similar in nature for our regional parks. And our regional parks are, are what a lot of us hear a lot about, right? Bicycle trails that don't, that are sucky. Walking trails that are not great. Things that are collapsing into our water bodies. <laughs> things that flood. A lot of that stuff exists in our regional system and we don't have a plan and we need one. So, just wanna share that. Thank you. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify the point I was trying to make, and I appreciate the direction Commissioner Menz took it, um, of removing things. <clears throat> what I was trying to pose is, is, the, is the tail wagging the dog a little bit. I'll just use tennis courts as an example. Um, the tennis court was, the, what I'm thinking of is specific, but there are many in our system, and there's many other things not tennis courts that are in this category, but I'm just using this as an example. The tennis court is not being used because it is cracked, destroyed, sits there, right? Because it's not being used, it did not get included in the master plan because it was seen as the community doesn't play tennis <laughs> or the community doesn't use the court. It's unusable. Um, it's like trying to play pool on a cracked pool table, right? It, it, it affects the game. So if the, if the court is all cracked and nasty, you can't play, right? Oh, sorry, I'm, I, the, the point is, it's just like, do, does that mean we need to revisit certain things and not put it into a capital project and, and see what would spring to life if we just fix those amenities? That was my point, sorry. Oh, sorry, Council Rice. I mean, I'm glad you're having this discussion, but it took Superintendent Mary Merrill Anderson in 2000 had negotiated a, a, a basically an earlier version of NPP 20 with Mayor Sales Belton 
to fix these assets and within two years within a year there was the uh, dot com burst r t ryback got elected and that was wiped out Oof. a deal for three million dollars was gone and the park board then over the next decade lost one hundred employees through the city budgeting process and so Yes, in, in that period then, things wore out. There was no capital budget for the park board to run on. Things turned to be threadbare. There was this huge system. And, you know, uh, John Gerben tried, uh, wasn't successful. Uh, Jane Miller, much to her credit, uh, put a ton of effort into this project, uh, rebuilt relationships with the city council. Mayor Hodges worked on it. Barb Johnson carried it. Lisa Goodman carried it. There were, you know, eventually Mayor Hodges came around and signed it, but it wasn't at the 15 million that was needed. It was at uh, 10 and a half. The $3 million that was put in the operating budget was only restored 40 of those 100 lost positions. So I know everybody wants to say, let's do more and do it, but if you, but for this, uh, 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 program you might be talking about which parks you're going to just turn the lights off on okay. and and it is an expensive system it needs to be maintained there's a lot of competing needs there's a certainly a I wouldn't say an unending need for funds but there's a critical need for funds and and you need to find them wherever you can get them and I sorry I missed last week because I know Commissioner Benny had some good ideas I've heard some other good ones there's always this effort why it's why we went to the uh, legislature for a decade to get the legacy amendment. I mean, I appreciate what Commissioner Musters is saying, but if this board hadn't gone to the legislature, uh, take $5 million out of your budget for the regional park system. And if you don't like the trails that are falling apart now, see where that would have been the last uh, 15 years and what shape the system would be in. Or the uh, uh, park dedication fee amount, which adds up to 25 or $30 million. Now that you, if you look at the report, you'll see a lot of these neighborhood projects benefited by park dedication fees too. So it's a, uh, anyway, sorry for, I'm done. President Forney, I, I know there are other questions, but I do want, and, and I appreciate the philosophical uh, question, Commissioner Thompson, but I wanna remind uh, all of you that we are five years into the program and we've spent nearly probably more than $60 million in our neighborhood parks, which is significant. And if you look at even what's up here, we'll spend more than $60 million in the next five year sequence. Um, and and to, to Council Rice's point, we were on a spiral downward quickly. Things were not getting better. And when things start to fail, they fail even more quickly. We're clearly moving in a different direction. Um, and I know there are things we're not getting to. But when you look at the possibility of even finishing the 20 year program, getting through every park before the end of the 20 year period and beginning to invest in some uh, parks twice, according to our equity metrics, um, the, 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 the work that the that staff and the board have done together to improve neighborhood parks in the system has been amazing in the first five years. And, to, and, and frankly, I think we're just getting better at it. Commissioner Benny. Just a quick thing, but what, what this looks like to me is <clears throat> it, you've systematized all of this and the staff and leadership of the current Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board wasn't handed, here's our asset management and here's all of our condition assessments and the level of service and all of that. You guys are, have started from scratch and that's something that is um, you know an older um, business model for public assets. So. This will just take some time as things get queued up to jump on the conveyor belt and go through the process in, a, in an orderly fashion and with what can be afforded. And, um, <clears throat> you know, things like the equity piece of this are great and huge. And that, that's a way for us to kind of um, calibrate um, our work as we go. So I, I don't know. I think this is, this is pretty exciting. and. Um, I, I think this shows that this has been a worthwhile investment from all partners in the city that put money into this program. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any more lights. Um, I, I think this conversation is incredibly important, particularly considering we have another budget meeting, uh, retreat, whatever, uh, uh, next week. Um, 
I don't know that there's much more I can say, but um, I, I think Council Rice is kind of nailing it that um, there's never enough funding. <laughs> but this was a huge, huge, huge lift. And as he said, historically, you know, there were some um, stops and starts to it all. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Assistant Superintendent um, Schroeder is saying it, that, you know, we, we, we're, we're getting smooth now. And so I'm really excited and I appreciate the report. And with that, I will move then to petitions and communications. And I think I started at this end, so I'm going to start with Commissioner Thompson. Uh, I would just like to say um, one thing, and this is sort of a general note since I have four seconds. Um, I don't want to be too syncophantic up here, but I just want to tell all my fellow commissioners how much I appreciate them. Um, per our MPD discussion and other ones that we've had up here, the amount of thought that everyone brings to the table um, really genuinely deeply means something to me. Um, whether we agree or not, I think that we as a board, um, we have a heart that is different than uh, some things that have been in our city in the last few years. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment to say how much I appreciate everyone in this room and everyone on this board. And uh, I feel like I'm better every week. I have to come to the table prepared <laughs> and you make me better. So. I just wanted to say that, and I won't be too, like I said, too syncophantic, but that's, that's, that's it from the north side right now. I would just like to say uh, thank you to the staff for all the hard work on bringing this Bidet Makoska uh, refectory um, to the table, and thank you for my fellow commissioners for supporting this project and moving it forward. Um, it's exciting to think next July we'll be able to sit there and have a sandwich or relax at the lake again. So that's really, I'm really excited in light of even this discussion that we've just had. We're very appreciative. I've had a busy cu last couple of weeks. I, I, I'll get to the emails and phone calls, and I know you all feel that same way too, but I had about seven committee, com community meetings this week, and all very good, and I appreciate all the input, um, and I think we're moving forward on a lot of things. And I just want to remind everyone real quickly that it is spring migration season for the birds. So we're seeing a lot of activity and species that you may not normally see year round in our city. And I'm kind of what you might call like a developing birder, but I have recognized a wood duck and I have recognized the loon. So I'm feeling really good about that. But I do want to, I, because I like to putz around with writing, I was in Loring Park this afternoon for 10 minutes. And there was, there was like a mob watching this great blue heron. And I, that's my other third one that I know. But I just want to write just this couple of sentences about this because I think um, this is what grounds us as commissioners and inspires us, um, I know, in lots of different ways. But this was um, kind of neat to see. There was about four of us watching her, I think. <laughs> um, she would lower her head, extend and twist her long neck, tilting her eye next to the water, watching, absolutely still. Then unexpectedly, she would jab the water with her beak, stabbing at the minnows. And from the bridge, the four of us were watching, you could look down and see the schools of minnow, you know, like she'd be right there in the middle and there'd be like a U shape, and the minute she would go, they would just scatter, and you could see this from the, from the bridge in the park. So anyways, get out in our parks and enjoy, enjoy the season. Thank you. So I saw that we are now below Cincinnati as far as our parks go. What the heck? We can do better. I know we're I know that you know the rankings we can quibble, but just saw that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the park rankings have a lot to do with data analytics and we can talk more about that at a, at a later date. Um, I too have been enjoying the birds. I'm very thankful to the Minnesota DNR for a tool that they have put out that's a poster of birds that are commonly seen um, passing through our state. And it's got pictures of all the birds and you can click on them and it'll um, play their song. So that you can also use that to help you with identification. I'm happy to send that to, to all of you. Um, 
or share it on Facebook so that you can find it there because I don't know if it's breaking open meaning a lot of email it to you. So I might do that. I'll share it on Facebook and you can find it there. Uh, it's a great tool. It's very helpful. It works on phones, which is also fantastic because when you're out in, in nature, sometimes that stuff doesn't work. <laughs> it's more intense. This is very, very user friendly. Um, other than that, it's, just, it's been very nice to see that it's getting warm and so many more people are out and about. And yes, that is generating a lot of emails to probably every single one of us. Um, so, so it's also, I think, a helpful reminder that when you're replying to people with um, inquiries about maintenance and garbage and all the things that we hear from people about, it's you can share the info um, email with them as well so that when they have those inquiries in the future, You've given them um, the ability to not only get that fish, but but procure it for themselves as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks. Commissioner Mans. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. So if we're talking about MPP20, I'm just going to say hashtag Carol Becker because she was really instrumental in that, and I don't think that we mentioned her. And if you ever need any history on that, call Carol Becker up, and she'll provide you with a lot of it. Um, for the bird lovers, I'd like to say that at Weissman Art Center, one of my constituents, uh, Gudrun Locke, has done a study of the nature of Shoreham Yards, which I don't know if you all know what that place is, but it's connected to Parkland Dog Park, actually. And she's done a, a study on the bird species that are there. And if you go to the Weissman and you see the map, she's done an incredible job of just exhibiting what degraded land could become. It sort of pushed my thinking a little bit on what we could do and how we could examine what parkland could be acquired. Also, I'm extremely happy that this board uh, unanimously supported moving forward with uh, land acknowledgement. Um, one person who's been really instrumental in me bringing that forward was a student that I met this year named Kaylee. And she won a scholarship. And I just, you know, sometimes we think about our constituents as adults who vote. And for me, a lot of the people who push me are young people who are of age who bring a lot of perspective that sometimes us adults just forget about. Um, the MPD discussion was also another place where I accessed student and young people who are impacted by these decisions. Um, so a, another, a student who works here for the youth design team, her name's Ray. Uh, so in and, and Northeast, I've spent a lot of time at baseball and softball fields lately, and I'd just really like to thank the park staff for making sure that we have some of the best fields in the city. Uh, but I will say that I have received a lot of communication, and one of the things that we can do better is communicate when those fields are closed. Um, and it doesn't take much. We just have to post it. Because when we close fields late, we impact families large scale. And I think that that's one thing that I'd like to push us to do is to think about how those decisions impact families or get kids out of school when the field is closed, when we knew about it. So th those things are, have been big in my inbox as a commissioner in Northeast Minneapolis who also is at baseball fields quite a bit. But the fields have been great when they're there. But if we have a, a field that is closed and 80 people end up there and 40 of them are students who had to leave early and we knew the field was closed at 8, we have to do better on communication about that for, for everyone. Thanks. Commissioner Alpha. So I would just like to echo what, what Becca said, and I feel like I want to use your first names in this, but I, I um, it's always so formal up here, but I really appreciate that sentiment. And I want to say it's been so great to uh, collaborate with, with some of you um, these past couple weeks with Stephanie on uh, Minnehaha Dog Park. I'm excited to move that forward and with Alicia on Corcoran Park. I'm excited about the future of that and then work with... Um, um, Tom, thinking about our parkways, and um, Elizabeth, you mentioned Loring Park, and it just made me think about our Minneapolis Public School connection, and that Emerson is right nearby, and can we get, you know, how do we, um, love to think more about that with you specifically with Loring Park and Emerson School. Thanks. Commissioner Benny. 
Um, <clears throat> just a quick comment. I uh, take an, often take a stroll that takes me through the Rose Garden, and this was the first time I went through last night. <clears throat> and um, it looks like the staff or the gardeners, but also I know there's a lot of volunteers um, had unmulched. I don't know if there's another term for that, the roses. And that's a lot of work, I think, that goes on there. And at some point, it might be nice to hear what the volunteer groups do at the Rose Garden. Um, but um, I saw a scene that's just every time I go in there, and I go in there multiple times a week in the you know summer months, um, families in there from all types of backgrounds in our city taking photographs, usually dressed way up, too. Um, and there we were last night, same thing, which was great. The other comment is both of the uh, fountains were unboxed, not on yet, which is fine. It's still been cold. Um, but it's just really nice, as everybody's saying, to see, um, see our summer looming. So thank you. Vice President Smith. Um, I'd just like to just kind of reiterate uh, uh, an advance thank you for the staff who will be out this summer um, and to our park police as we gear up for unfortunately what looks like a really uh, violent summer here in Minneapolis. We had a shooting yesterday at Corcoran Park in the middle of the afternoon um, while young people were there and so it just it, it's a reminder that things are happening across our city and the parks will be instrumental to helping to keep those young people active and have a productive way to let out their energy um, and just to be engaged and potentially safe, uh, but also thinking about the safety of the staff as they experience this stuff at, on a daily basis. And that's something that concerns me as I hear from people who work for our parks uh, feeling like they're suffering and they have no other alternative for work because they wanna stay committed to the work that they do but how do we keep them safe? And so thanking them in advance and encouraging us all to think creatively at how we address the violence, not only happening in our parks, but just across our city um, in proximity to our parks. And so how do we help people not feel uh, continuously traumatized by the violence happening around us? And how do we all take ownership as a community and create a, a, a village mentality for caring for one another? And so that's what I would stress. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, in spite of our long conversation about uh, MP20 and uh, rehab and stuff like that, I, I didn't get an opportunity to go out walking uh, uh, today, whatever, but I do believe that the uh, trail around uh, Badeva McCoskey on the west side is completed. And it's like, hoorah! Uh, I don't know how many people realize that one of the reasons why we um, haven't been able to attend to that is because asphalt was not available. So um, anyway, I uh, just want you to know that things are happening out there, uh, slow but sure. Um, and speaking of uh, being outside and enjoying it all, I took a group of friends of mine to um, one of our nature walks with the uh, one of our uh, environmentalists, uh, Mel, um, he, down here at uh, Waterworks. And encourage people to do that, although I believe that they are booked between now and the end of May. Um, I'm amazed that nobody else said anything, but uh, we had Arbor Day, and hoorah! I mean, my goodness, I, it, it, it just floors me every year. I mean, Ralph and Phil, you, you just pull it out every time. This one was so unique in the sense that it was an urban street. You know, there weren't trees, you know, we, we uh, here, um, uh, dug the hole and and we excuse me no we filled the hole filled the hole excuse me <laughs> anyway no we didn't dig it anyway anyway it just it, i marvel at you know how good i mean I, I need you all to know i don't know how many people know who don willicky is but when don willicky actually sends an email and says thank you you know you've done good so um hurrah on um, once again being terribly creative and everything um and then lastly, uh, I thought we had a fabulous um, budget retreat uh, last week, and I look forward to our next one uh, next week. And uh, to address uh, the comment that um, Commissioner Olson said about uh, the trust, the trust, I do believe, um, changed up the matrix. And I am hoping that we will have a report from staff about, you know, how does that impact us? Will we ever be first again? I mean, what they're doing is they're challenging not just us, but all systems throughout the nation and everything. And so 
we you know set a standard whatever and uh, other people are rising to it so it's an exciting thing but their matrix is new and different and i, I just hope that we will be able to um, learn from that and realize that no we've done good and we set a really great standard and we'll continue to do so with that i am declaring the meeting adjourned and move on to admin and finance here at 902. i will call the admin and finance committee to order here at 902. Uh, Secretary Ringel, can you take the roll? Vice President Smith. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Menz. Here. Co-Chair Thompson. Here. Co-Chair Schaefer. Here. You have a quorum. May I have a committee member uh, move the agenda? So moved. Any questions? All in favor of the agenda, please say aye. 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 May I have a committee member please approve the minutes for um april 20th 2022 so moved any discussion all in favor of approving the admin finance committee meetings of april 20th please say aye aye great we will move on to our action items for this evening of which there are <coughs> six um may i have a committee member please move our first resolution I would like to move resolution 2022-168, resolution approving an agreement with JLD Group LLP for five operating seasons beginning June 1st, 2022 and expiring December 31st, 2026 for Theodore Worth and Hiawatha Golf Club. Is there any questions around this? Commissioner Olson? And tonight we have uh, Director Humphrey here. Thank you. Great, yeah, so I saw that as far as choosing what gets served, and typically it happens in, in March the year before, is, is that still going to come before us? Or is that not something that comes before it? I thought I saw that in the packet. We require a menu to review a staff. Uh, okay, so but, staff but the staff reviews it. Yeah, it's just to make sure that the concept is what, what was proposed in the RFP. So, for example, just use this. You, you serve seafood and next, all of a sudden you serve steak. It's like, well, wait a minute. You This is what you said. So that's why we okay. just review all menus for all concessions. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just, yeah, totally fine. Cool. Thanks. Any further questions? All right. All those in favor of uh, moving and passing resolution 2022-168, please say aye. 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 May I have a committee member please move resolution 2022-170. Uh, I'll move it. Uh, I propose we move resolution 2022-170, resolution approving a concession agreement with GC Ventures to provide food and beverage concession services at Columbia Golf Course <coughs> and Gross National Golf Club. Thank you very much, Vice President Smith. Any questions on this resolution? Yeah. All those in favor of passing resolution 2022-170, please say aye. 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 Great. You got two down. <laughs> <laughs> the next resolution. Someone please bring it forward. Uh, bringing forth resolution 2022-186, resolution approving agreement with Mississippi Park Connection for installation, operation, and maintenance of paddle share stations at North Mississippi Regional Park, Boom Island located within the Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park, Graco Park within Above the Falls Regional Park, and Mississippi George Regional Park. Thank you very much. This is an exciting program. Does anybody have any questions? All those in favor of passing resolution 2022-186, please say aye. 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 Next resolution, please. Uh, I'll, I'll move uh, resolution 2022-188, resolution approving a three-year lease agreement with the Minnesota School of Botanical Art for Space in the Longfellow House to expire on December 31st, 2024. Thank you very much. And we have Director Olson who has been waiting patiently this evening. There's a little bit of discrepancy between the resolution and the contract. And we've been working through this this week. But if Director Olson can give us kind of uh, 
where we're headed with that discrepancy and then maybe council rice you can direct us if we can just vote on it or if we have to have an amendment next week what what the procedural steps are good evening commissioners co-chair schaefer it's a pleasure to be here this evening to speak about the uh, botanical school of art and their lease at the longfellow house um, the discrepancy that was <clears throat> mentioned is about the rent. Um, I have been uh, doing some version control and I think that I merged uh, a few different versions together. So my resolution um, within uh, the background materials includes information about how much rent will be charged. Um, and it is, it, there's some inconsistency within the lease document. However, it is not in the resolution language. So I would propose that I bring forward a lease next meeting, if you were to pass this, that would be consistent with the background language. Um, it would not change the um, written resolution here approving a three-year lease agreement with the Minnesota School of Botanical Art for Space in the Longfellow House to expire on December 31st, 2024. Um, <clears throat> the lease is based on 15% of class revenue and a monthly installment. So um, when I wrote up the background materials, I wrote it one way and it conflicts with what I wrote uh, in the lease agreement. So. Um, one that supplements and one that is on top of. Um, so I would want to go back and make sure that those were trued up. Um, that's, that's the inconsistency uh, that still remains, uh, but I appreciate your sharp eye. Yep. Council Rice, is there any um, issues with that approach? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is this, uh, like, could I ask uh, uh, Ms. Olson a question? Yes, please. This lease time sensitive. Could it just wait for another cycle and then brought back to this committee? Or does it have to be acted on by the end of the month? Um, Co-chair Schaefer, Council Rice. The lease has expired. Oh, I see. Uh, when did it expire? It expired at the end of 2021. And I did not realize that. So it was uh, an extension and it has now expired. Um, upon notification from our real property manager, I uh, put together this resolution working with uh, Ann, Ann Walter, Walter okay. and uh, with the tenant. Okay, uh, yeah, I, uh, Madam Chair, excuse me. Yeah, I, if the board wants to advance it, uh, I'll personally look at this and get a, a, an action ready to, for you to recommend or an amendment prepared if one, if one needs to be done at, for the board meeting. We should have a, a lease in place just in case something happens, so yeah. I wouldn't recommend delaying. Okay. Thank you very much, Council Rice, and thank you, Director Olson. Does any of the other committee members have any questions in regards to this matter? All right. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Um, we will now take a vote on Resolution 2022-188. All those in favor of approving this three-year lease agreement, uh, please say aye. 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 That passes. Uh, may I have someone please bring forth 2022-189? Uh, sure, I'll do this one. Uh, I am moving Resolution 2022-189, uh, Resolution Approving Three One-Year license agreements with Lime, Spin, and Lift, respectively, for authorization to place equipment on MPRB property and permission to operate shared bike and scooter programs throughout the Minneapolis Park system. Great. Thank you. Does anyone... Oh, thank you. Chair, Co-Chair Thompson. Yes, there's an amendment to this. But can I read the amendment? Yes, please. Um, uh, resolution to amend 2022-189 would like to add... Um, <clears throat> whereas MPRB trails have a speed limit of 10 miles an hour, whereas the proximity of pedestrian bike trails can be close or even share a trail and create pedestrian safety concerns with lower power vehicles, and whereas our parks feature includes a denser city and an older population per the Parks for All plan, resolved MPRB staff will implement a pilot speed limit program with SBSP using geofencing capabilities in a minimum of two locations as part of the 2022 MPRB scooter operation plan when agreements with S 
SB-SP and the RMPRB are effective on parkland this season. And resolved, two reduced speed zones for scooters will be implemented for the 2022 season in collaboration with partnering jurisdictions. The two target areas are along West River Parkway and Central River Sun Riverfront Regional Park between 3rd Avenue South and 13th Avenue South, and on Victor Memorial Parkway. MPRB staff have flexibility to adjust the length of these target areas or add additional test areas. Prior to the 2023 license renewal, these pilots will be assessed by MPRB staff for potential expansion. Thank you, Co-Chair Thompson. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Olson. Is this for Director Olson? I mean, Director, well, well, I, yeah, I, Olson. Yeah. Well, for, I guess first, if whoever authored the amendment would like to speak to it. If, if um, sure, yes, I will speak to it. Oh, did you want to? Did you have a question? Have a shot at it? Well, yeah, I just had some comments on it. But. Go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, no, this is, yeah, I think this is interesting. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, certainly uh, an interesting pilot of being able to control these speeds because, you know, it is something that, you know, goes on right now and it's not just scooters, right? If you, you can't really, if you're going down one of our paths, it's it's difficult to ride casually alongside someone. Um, you know, you'll be on your left quite a bit. And, um, you know, I, so I think the ultimate, you know, solution for, you know, any, this kind of problem in general is creating more space um, which is you know, what I'm pushing for all the time. Um, and yeah, I think this is really interesting. You know, I would really love to see these sort of um, speed measures, uh, speed limit measures implemented in you know, future vehicles. You know, there's really no reason that people need to be going over the speed limit with, with any vehicle. Uh, so that'd be kind of cool if we could show the, the efficacy of this. So uh, yeah, uh, good ad, thanks. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. Any other comments or questions on the amendment? Co-Chair Thompson. I would just like to offer my support for this amendment. We, we discussed it um, at, at length and, and Co-Chair Schaefer wrote it up, but it, it um, is definitely something that I think should be at least piloted so we can get some other information and see what's possible. So I support it. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner Alpert. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not on this committee, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. So I saw the amendment come through, and I wondered how many um, like incidents of crashes we had due to scooters and as opposed to due to cars. And um, I, I, I'm sure that I know that Chief Ohado has left, but I'm sure he'd be willing to share that with us all. Um, but I just want to say I, I plan to support the amendment and the resolution and the full board, but I just want to say um, there have been there have been no reports of scooter crashes in parks. I, be, I believe I'm reading that that right. Um, uh, so I just I just I I I support it because I, I think speeding is a, is a big issue overall, and I I hope that we would take the same sort of sentiment and apply it to all spheres is all I'm saying. Thank you. Director Olson, did you have any further comment on that? Um, Co-Chair Schaefer, um, Commissioners, Commissioner Alper, uh, not specifically. However, um, I work closely with our Park Police Department and um, the City of Minneapolis who keeps um, a compliance dashboard. They filter all um, complaints and reports through Minneapolis 311 and through a reporting um, kind of application and dashboard. And uh, anything serious uh, that has happened, I have not had a report of. So to Commissioner Alper's um, point, I have not been given information that there have been uh, crashes. I understand that there are certainly concerns. Um, and I uh, work closely and keep an eye on, on what's happening as far as reported uh, incidents that, and how the, they impact us in the parks, for what it's worth. Thank you. And I'll just add one other comment. Um, I believe, and you can confirm this, uh, uh, Director Olson, um, the 311 app was shut down. Was it in July of 2021? So there was at a point where for the end of the season, people were unable to report scooters in the parkland, scooters on the trails um, because of um, 
some legal issues, I believe. Um, co chair Schaefer, Schaefer um, commissioners, three one, the 311 app wasn't shut down. The that functionality for scooters, for scooters specifically yeah. was um, temporarily shut off due to misuse of the reporting feature. Uh, it broke the terms of agreement for yeah. use uh, due to um, negative. Uh, and harassing comments, I think, that were coming through. That was my understanding. Uh, however, um, we have data from all of the years of this, um, of the time that the scooters have been within our jurisdiction. Um, so we can lean on that data. Yeah. Uh, we also have some functions in place for compliance and reporting um, for this year that are, uh, even better. I have. Oh. I can show you. That if you'd like. That would be great. If you'd like. Um, while I'm doing that, though, while I'm pulling this up, feel free to keep yes, talking. Yes, Commissioner Menz, did you have another question or comment? I just, and maybe I, I missed this in the, in the documents, but I mean, how is it going to be enforced? And is there going to be a ticket? If, or are they just not going to be equipped to go over 10 miles an hour? Uh, Co-Chair Schaefer, Commissioner Menz, um, when there is a speed zone that's implemented using uh, geofence technology, it powers down the scooter so the scooter can't go beyond that speed. Um, <clears throat> there are speed zones that are within the city already. An example of that, there is a speed zone on the Stone Arch Bridge of 10 miles per hour. So as a scooter approaches and is on the Stone Arch Bridge, it's powered down to 10 miles per hour. And then as it exits that area within about a 30 feet wash zone, it is able to speed up again. There are um, technical uh, limitations to that though. I mentioned that 30 foot kind of wash zone, right? Well, the great thing about the Stone Arch Bridge is that it runs over water. So all of that area, it doesn't matter if there's any kind of slush on that geofence because you're stuck on that bridge and you're, it's not impacting anything else beyond that. But once you get onto, say, a path that's adjacent to a parkway and scooters are allowed on the parkway or on a city street, maybe if you're, if you're cruising down Chicago Avenue on your scooter in the, in the bike lane or in the street, I don't know which, and you go by a park. We have three parks that are on Chicago Avenue. And if, say, we had a geofence on that park, that would power that scooter down to 10 miles per hour in running traffic. So we have to be careful of those zones and that kind of slush factor of that maybe 30 feet. The other place where it gets a little touchy with those geofence zones is in areas like downtown where there are tall buildings and there aren't places for those pings to make it down because this is all using like satellite technology. And another area to think about are bridges or overpasses, things that go over each other or as we intersect with roads. So I'm going to learn a lot more about this as we move through this season. Uh, that's why I appreciate the opportunity and guidance to um, work with these vendors on pilot areas that may be small to start. And as we start to grow, we can determine whether or not it's possible or to power up and power down in particular areas and if it's remains safe for the user. The, the follow-up follow question was, um, like, is there any, are we going to issue tickets if somebody's using the scooter irresponsibly or destructively? I mean, like, is that something that could be of risk to people who use the scooters to come in conflict with um, law enforcement? Mm -hmm. um, Co-Chair Schaefer, Commissioner Menz, I can't speak to that. Uh, I would have to ask Chief Ohado. Um, to my knowledge, there have not been citations issued previously to scooter users. <laughs> However, um, the, if there are complaints on a particular scooter and we're able to pinpoint that scooter or that device, whether it be by that ID of the, of the device, um, location, if things are left, we can trace back, the vendors can trace back to the user and then the vendors can shut down their access, um, things of that nature. We had that happen last year uh, where there was damage done to one of our park properties and the scooter was ditched. Um, well, that was easy. That was like, you know, 
you don't even have to choose your own adventure you just dial up that number and you know exactly who ditched it there so um, the vendors are on top of that as well and so it's kind of a, an effort between the two between uh, the jurisdictions and the vendors thank you you're welcome great any other questions or comments I'll just close out with saying top scooter speed is 15 miles per hour so the differential this is something director Olson we've dialogued a little bit about is it's not going to be probably huge you know it might be 12 might it probably won't go down to 10 if it's it's near a parkway um, but that's something that you know it's a different story with e-bikes and that may be something that we have to eventually deal with as a board um, right now this is where we're starting and um, I think it's a good start I think it's a fair start for the companies for the city and I just want to give a public thank you to Deputy Ringgold, uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold and Director Olson. I attended a meeting on this like in December with the downtown community and they've been on this for months. And so this whole dialogue that you guys have um, initiated and worked through, you may not know it, but last year our parks were not geofenced at all in this city. They were in St. Paul, but not in Minneapolis. And so between this early dialogue, the city got the park geofences in, which means that you can't end a scooter ride in our park between the hours that our parks are closed, between midnight and six. And that's, that's really huge for the community. And so I wanna just say thank you to that. And we were gonna put the Stone Arch Bridge and the city did it. So, I mean, I just really wanna say a public thank you to Director Olson for all your hard work and getting into all these details. And, and um, Secretary Ringgold, it really means a lot to the community and to me personally. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, Co-Chair Schaefer, I'd like to point, make a point of clarification. Sure. Um, I have learned that there are scooters that can go 20 miles per hour. Okay. So uh, that, but that's consistent with our parkway uh, speed limit. So this okay. will be um, an opportunity for me to learn more about that and to continue to, to experiment with those geofences. So I just wanted to make sure that I put that out there. Okay. Thank you. Um, but this is in great partnership with the city of Minneapolis and their staff and with the University of Minnesota and their staff. We have a really strong cohort of uh, micromobility jurisdiction representatives who are working together on this to make it a seamless experience for users and to make things easy on the jurisdictions. So we're all kind of working off the same playbook. Great. Thank you, Director Olson. You're welcome. So let's take first a, a vote on the amendment, I believe is how we do this. So all those in favor of the amendment that been proposed by Co-Chair Thompson on Resolution 2022-1989, please say aye. 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 Any against it? No. So now we'll take a vote on passing the resolution 2022-189. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion passes, amendment and resolution. May I have a committee member please bring forth our last action item. I would like to move resolution 2022-193, resolution approving 2023-2026, strategic directions and performance goals and adopting priority strategies from Parks for All, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Comprehensive Plan 2021 to 2020 to 2036 for the same four year time period. Any questions or comments on this uh, resolution? We've given a lot of prior questions and comments to these. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done a lot of work on this and I'm really excited that we are bringing this forward and thank you again to all the staff for your hard work on this. All those in favor of passing resolution 2022-193, please say aye. 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 Thank you. I will declare the admin and finance, that passes. I declare the admin and finance committee adjourned. <laughs>